because what we're going to be talking about now is our evening's program. So at this point, I will ask you guys to sort of take your, your seats in the order I have your names up there. And, uh, you know, we have a great panel here. I think you'll leave this evening with a far better understanding of the impact of this Washington State Supreme Court decision. Uh, here's the, the Hearst decision, and then we have assenting and dissenting views on it. A very interesting reading that you're just going, I'm not sure this is a good thing, and we know it isn't. So the final decision was handed down by our Supreme Court on October 6, 2016, and it really should be called the FutureWise decision, not the Hearst decision. Uh, FutureWise was the lead entity organizing the and facilitating the lawsuit against the Western Washington Growth Management Hearings Board. In fact, Hillary France, who we elected as our now Commissioner of Public Lands, guys, elections mean something, was the CEO of FutureWise during this legal proceeding. But not to get the cart before the horse, major problems for rural development came to the forefront with the Growth Management Act, which passed on April Fool's Day, appropriately enough, in 1990. It was signed into law by Democratic Governor Booth Gardner. There he is. The GMA's purpose was to identify and protect critical areas in natural resource lands and to see that cities and counties within the state adopt regulations to protect them. So among things that they used that they were protecting against was preventing urban sprawl. What the act did was it set up a system of order and control for housing development. It definitely established a revenue generation system for local governments to maintain and enforce control. And it also provided many points for environmental groups to litigate, which resulted in expanded government control and the taking of individual property rights. So FutureWise is the current litigation leader in Washington State for these types of things. And as you can see, they've got a lot of friends. <coughs> when a group such as FutureWise determines that the GMA is not being followed and has damaged you know, an individual's rights or a class of people's rights, they file a complaint with the Growth Management Hearings Board. That's what happened in the case of what we call hers that should be FutureWise. So in this case, FutureWise challenged Whatcom County's comprehensive plan along with the lines that it didn't protect the quality and availability of water as required by the GMA. Unfortunately, the GMA board ruled against Whatcom County and then through appeals and things, it ended up with Washington Supreme Court and to keep it simple, Whatcom County lost. So what we've ended up with is what I call a tangled mess. It was a six to three ruling. Again, elections matter. Three of the judges that voted in favor of this were up for election. Did we replace them? No, we left them there. <coughs> Excuse me. So this has really set up another battle along rural and urban lines. And it's seen by many especially people in the rural areas, as a major taking of private property rights. Senator Judy Warnick, who's here with us tonight, said, access to water is a basic human right, and finding a solution to Hearst that allows families to build on their property with a reliable source of water is not only a necessity, it is a moral obligation for elected officials in this state. So there'll be a lot of talking, my opinion, but in the end, the result will most likely just bring us more regulation, more agencies, more fees, and less freedom. So now that you know how I feel, what I want to do is introduce you to our panelists. And I've got them seated in order of how they're going to be presenting. So first we have Mike Hermanson. And Mike, I might have pictures. Look at there. Woohoo! Uh, Mike is the uh, Water Resource Manager for Spokane County Environmental Services. 
He has over 18 years experience in water resource work. Over the past 10 years with Spokane County, he's been the project manager scientist for numerous water resource investigations. I need a drink of something. <coughs> Beer is good. Beer is food. Um, he now manages the development of the Little Spokane Water Bank, and he's been part of a team developing Spokane County's response to the Hearst decision. A lot of information with this man here, so we have questions and answers at the end, so keep track of your questions. He's a lifelong resident of the Spokane area, other than a few years when he spent on, uh, that he spent on the west side when he was earning his degree in environmental science from Western uh, Washington <laughs> University. And just so you know, he lives in a rural area of the county and in 2006 built his home and is on an exempt well. So he sort of knows what's facing everybody here. So good deal. Next we have Josh Kearns. He is our uh, District 1 Commissioner. So it says here, lifelong residents of Spokane and all that good kind of stuff. And I always put that he's Joey's father and Nicole's husband because he's a great dad and just loves the heck out of Joey. I think most of us here know Josh. He and Mike Voles upset the conventional thinking in Spokane County that the politicians with the most money win the elections. These guys just beat their feet. And I forget how much weight Josh lost or how many shoes he went through doorbelling, but he won this commissioner position and surprised those who did not know him. Didn't surprise any of us here in the room, did he? No. That was great. He is here tonight to represent the county concerning the issues the county is facing because of Hearst. He is not here tonight to talk about the appointment process, so when we get to questions and answers, remember that because we will not be having any questions as far as the commissioner race goes. Next we have Senator Judy Warnick. And it is so exciting to have her come all the way from Moses Lake to be with us tonight. Uh, and I do want you all to know, because this was just announced on Saturday, I believe, the Association of Washington Business just announced naming her their Legislator of the Year. Quite an honor, congratulations. A little bit better about having you come all this way when I learned that you were raised in Deer Park on a dairy farm. So I was really hoping that you had family in this area still and could get some personal time in besides just driving back and forth. And so I'm glad, glad, glad of that. Uh, as you can see, Senator Warnick is the chair of the Senate Agricultural, Water, Trade, and Economic Development Committee, long name, and on the website it's described as addressing this, uh, uh, as addressing issues relating to agricultural production, marketing, and sales. The committee also looks at water issues, including water quantity and municipal water, and policies and programs that affect economic development, including international trade and economic development incentives. So it sounds a lot to handle, but in reading that she was raised on a dairy farm, I know that hard work is not a stranger to her, because I don't know anybody that was raised on a dairy farm that doesn't know what hard work is. So as chair of this committee with a long title, she'll be able to fill us in on the bipartisan bill the Senate passed, the what we call the no Hearst fix, no capital budget situation, and what she says ahead for, is ahead for all of us. So I really thank you for coming over here and being with us. Jacqueline Maycumber. She was appointed to the seventh district seat by the commissioners from five counties to fill the vacancy of Shelley Short, who replaced Brian Danzel. Prior to her appointment, she was Shelley's legislative assistant, so she was really ready for this job day one and could just go right to work. The seventh has got to be one of the largest districts by area in the state. I'm not sure if it is the largest, it's the second. And so it includes Ferry County, Pend Oreille County, Stevens County, and parts of Spokane and Okanagan counties. They're mostly rural except for the redistricting that pushed a finger of the seventh down as far as Francis Avenue. I mean, stupidest darn thing I ever saw. Anyway, that's my opinion. It's very 
<laughs> so here is a description of what the environmental uh, committee handles, of which she's the assistant ranking member. Dave Taylor is the ranking member, I believe. The House Environment Committee considers issues relating to the State Environmental Policy Act, the Shoreline Management Act, air quality, aquatic lands, oil spill prevention, recycling, and solid waste, hazardous waste, toxics, climate change, and parks and recreation. The committee also oversees the Puget Sound Partnerships activities in Puget Sound and Hood Canal. So I'm pretty sure that Hearst probably took up quite a bit of time this last session. And maybe you can fill us in on Hearst in the House. And maybe why the House wouldn't consider Senate Bill 5329. Might be a good thing to know. And I got to tell you guys, I've been looking at pictures of, you know, our legislators and things. And I'm a gal, so I can say this because it's not sexist. She's the best looking legislator we have in <laughs> Olympia. <laughs> yeah. Now I got her blushing. It's great. <laughs> and last we have Russell Bolton. Uh, many of you probably know Russell from the Stevens County Assembly, and I just learned from Russell that Stevens County Assembly is being assimilated into a greater effort known as Freedom Force in International, and he's been appointed the Northwest Operational Director. And just so you guys on the panel know where he sits, that organization is greatly responsible for the victory over water banking in San Luis Obispo County in California. And he has also put some uh, flyers in the back there that you might want to grab called Water Banking in Washington State, What You Need to Know. So they're at the back table. Uh, so Russell's going to be bringing us an opposing view to the table tonight, uh, a role that he's not unfamiliar with. And I guess our sheriff would call him a right-wing radical. But then that's what he calls a lot of us, so congratulations. <laughs> Russell is a former U.S. Marine. He's been married for 26 years, has three children, and two of them are now serving in the U.S. Marines. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for your service and your son's service, and that's our panel tonight. So let's get started with Mike. And I'm moving this so we get your pictures and your pretty faces. <coughs> I'm ready for sound, too. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. Switch on Yeah, if it gets really bad, just switch it off. Okay. So, uh, my name is Mike Hermanson. I'm the Water Resource Manager for Spokane County. And I'm going to be talking um, about primarily water resource management in the Little Spokane River Basin, or what is called Water Resource Inventory Area 55. Um, it's a story about the, the change of water management and in this basin that's started you know, before 1973 and has continually changed up till the present. And this Background information is really important to understand as, as we explain Spokane County's approach and why we're doing what we're doing. So, do I have a clicker for a next slide? You know, that would be a good idea, wouldn't it? <laughs> I like my clicker. I just <laughs> there you go. I clicked, but you can click next time. So I'm going to look at, you know, just some real basic stuff about the water code and where we've been in Wira 55. Um, look at how the permit exemption has started to come into play and when it did, and then also some of the legislative solutions and how we think that will um, affect Spokane County. And then if we have time after all of that, um, look a little bit at how the water bank in uh, Wire 55 that we're developing will address the limitations we have. So it's really important to go back to the, the foundation of the water code in the state of Washington. And, you know, it starts with this um, RCW. It, in 1917, it was established for um, the surface water uh, code and then 1945 for the groundwater code. And the, the passage up there is from uh, the groundwater code. 
you know, and it says, um, all natural groundwaters of the state are hereby declared to be public groundwaters and to belong to the public to be subject to appropriation for beneficial use under the terms of this chapter. And that's pretty important because it establishes the view of what the water resource, who it belongs to. And the important thing also is that no beneficial use rises above another. So agricultural use does not ri rise above industrial use and domestic use does not rise above agricultural use. And that, that's a really important piece because that's not the way it is in other states. And you know, as the 10th Amendment um, specifies, the states can really do different things when it re comes to water management. And there's a long-standing tradition of um, deference to state law from the federal government and also from the federal courts. And so, for example, in Texas, you have the law of capture, which is um, property owners are entitled to any water that's below their property. And that is essentially, it's, it's any water that's below their property and then any water that they induce coming onto their property from an adjoining property. And so it's really basically the biggest pump wins. Um, so that one some, sometimes does not work out well for an adjoining property owner. And then also in um, South Dakota, you have uh, what I would call a domestic priority, which sets domestic use above all else's, uh, all other uses. And then in Oklahoma, you have uh, similar to Washington, where domestic use is exempt from permitting, but it is not, uh, there's no precedence for it. So in Wire 55, water management really started 44 years ago. Um, what happened was apparently there was some disagreements about how water should be managed. And as you can see, this is the passage from uh, a regulation that withdrew waters from the Little Spokane watershed. And it says, uh, this regulation has been precipitated by changing patterns of land usage in the Little Spokane River watershed, reflected in a conflict between owners of agricultural land and owners of residential riparian property. And so, as they did actually in uh, Kittitas County in 2007, the um, State of Department of Ecology withdrew the waters from the Little Spokane watershed pending a review of the resource and determining who, you know, what are the best uses of the resource. Otherwise known as developing an in-stream flow rule. And so, Per the provisions of the 1969 Minimum Flows and Levels Act and also the 1971 Water Resources Act, um, the state basically said, until you establish a water resources management program, there's no more water that we're going to allocate. Just there's, there's no more to be had and um, essentially figure it out so we can start uh, getting back to the business of appropriating water. And one particularly important section of that, and this was the first in-stream flow rule in the state of Washington. Um, and I guess a, a real impactful statement in the rule was, all rights hereafter established shall be expressly subject to the base flows established in this section. And it's probably one of the more sweeping statements in an in-stream flow rule. Um, you guys probably don't go around and read all the in-stream flow rules, but I have <laughs> had the occasion to read a lot of them. And this one is, is it was the first one, so they, they weren't too artful about it. And so that's it really just laid a blanket statement there. And so now from this point forward, we have a different way of managing water in Little Spokane. There were going to be no new surface water rights that weren't impacted by that base flow. So they only authorized surface water rights that were conditioned on the base flow, which means when the base flow falls below a certain point, then those people have to stop using the water. So. I would say about every, three out of every f three or four years, um, people get a letter that says, okay, you had a water right to irrigate your orchard. This year you can't irrigate your orchard. And so they're told to, with, to stop watering. But at the same time, though, groundwater permits and certificates were continuing to be issued um, with the idea that this was really a surface water regulation. So the, you know, the frame of reference for the, the people that wrote the rules, this, this is a, a surface water regulation. But as ecology started to develop other rules, 
they needed to define what uh, the hydraulic continuity, the connection between surface and groundwater. And so they developed a policy to start to, uh, to address that. And the policy was that if you're in a certain distance within a stream, that you know, essentially what happens if you start pumping your um, well, then you reduce the head in the aquifer. And instead of the water going into the stream, it goes back to your well. So they said within a certain distance of the stream in an unconfined aquifer, that's, that's hydraulic continuity. And if you capture 5% or more of stream flow, but as we know, the courts change things. And so they reinterpreted what that really means. And so two um, decisions, and this, a lot of this came from agricultural um, disputes. Um, one of them was in Lincoln County. It was a, the case of the Sinking Creek, Redditowski versus Department of Ecology. And then another one called uh, Hubbard versus Department of Ecology in Okanagan County. And what those did was really establish that hydraulic continuity is not as defined as that uh, and, and doesn't have to be as significant as that 1980 guideline. And so the 5% now changes to any connection to surface water is, a, um, is, is continuity and um, can induce an impairment. And so as a result of that, in WIRA 55, they stop issuing groundwater permits. So after 1976, they issued groundwater permits to municipal water purveyors, Deer Park, Whitworth, they issued them to other people. Other, so there are water rights that were issued after the in-stream flow rule, but now they stopped. So now we have a new threshold of regulation in the Little Spokane watershed. Um, and then they continue to regulate surface water rights. And then in um, 2000, there was a, a, a pretty defining court case called Postuma v. Ecology. And Mike, this... Could you just sort of let them, when people are hearing Little Spokane, they're thinking it's just Little Spokane. Can you sort of let them know what that area is? Oh, sure. I'm sorry. I use it, I, I've got a picture of it here. It's like second nature at this point for me. That is the Little Spokane watershed. And so it's, it's you know, it includes all of, uh, includes majority of it's Spokane County and then Ponderay County and Stevens County. And it's the area that um, drains at the very end um, into the uh, Spokane River. Um, it also includes an area of the Spokane Valley Rathdrum Prairie Aquifer. So in other words, this is you. <laughs> you know, yeah, I just want, you know. it's you and all the people that call me every day. So um, the question of what is an in-stream flow, what kind of water right is it? It's, it's in, the, um, in the RCWs that it's a water right, but there was a contention that it wasn't as equal of water right as to an appropriated water right. So that um, I, kind of notion was tested in this um, court case and it basically said an in-stream flow water right is the same as any other water right and because we don't take precedence over any type of use it's, it's on the same playing field as everybody else and it also really put a fine point on the fact that any groundwater use that has any calculable effect on a surface water is, is impairment So this was all occurring in the permitted water right world. But back in 2002 in uh, court case Campbell and Gwynn, the exempt well started to become the focus. And it's, it's very related because they stopped issuing um, permits. So nobody could get a permit to build a subdivision or anything. And so they started allowing, you know, just saying, well, just drill a well. So now the focus comes on permit exempt wells. and. In this uh, court decision, it said uh, permit exempt use is just like any other appropriated water use. And so now we have, um, it's a, a use, it's no greater nor lesser of any other water right. And so it's on the even, even playing field with all the other uses. So we, at each court decision, we basically had a, a, another significant um, change in water resource management. But with this decision and then um, 
nothing really happened with permit exempt wells. And so in, uh, in Wyra 55, um, nobody can get a water right. Surface water, ho water right holders are being turned off, um, but permit um, exempt wells are still going in. They're going in all around. So um, you, if you're kind of in, you know, watching water law and water resource management, you're kind of scratching your head a little bit and you're saying, well, hmm, that doesn't quite make sense, but nobody regulates them, so nobody asks. And then um, when Kittitas County, um, the moratorium started there, that is when we took notice and said, wow, they're, they're uh, actually regulating permit exempt wells based on a senior water right. This, this could be a problem in, in the Spokane, Little Spokane River. But nobody really regulates permit exempt wells, so um, it was kind of a you know, finger pointing really between ecology and the county saying, no, you do it, no, you do it. We regulate land use, you regulate water, so. But that uh, question, you know, these questions always get answered finally, and that was answered in 2011 in the um, Growth Management Hearings Board versus Kittitas County, and that pretty much said, counties, when you issue a building permit and there's no water source and you know ex an exempt well is being drilled, then you are de facto authorizing that new use. And, but they did say you should work with Ecology. So actually at that time, Spokane County, we went and met with Ecology and said, what does the Little Spokane River in-stream flow rule really mean? And um, they said they'd talk to the AG and get back to us. And then we never really heard anything, which we took as, okay, good, no news is good news. We'll just keep doing what we're doing. And then the Hearst decision. So this, this is where the, the rubber meets the road for the county, really. And the holdings that we really paid attention to and are critical in our decision making are, the first one is that permit exempt wells cannot impair senior water rights. And it, you know, this is a quote from the decision, there's no question that a permit exempt well may not infringe on earlier established right to water under the doctrine of prior appropriation. And that's, that's a really key, that's a foundational concept that is really hard to deal with. Um, prior appropriation is just a simple concept that is hard to work around, especially in a state where there is no priority of, of domestic use above everything else. We also found out again that um, a county is responsible, that this was established in 2011, but um, it was said again. And this was the one that really came out of left field, I think, was that Counties cannot rely on ecology to make a legal availability decision. And, it, and they were not, they did not mince words about it. In the decision it says, counties may not rely on ecology's inaction and failing to close a basin as a determination that water is presumptively available. So in any place where ecology hasn't officially done something with an in-stream flow and, and if in a basin with an in-stream flow rule, if they haven't regulated, we cannot use that as, as a presumption that water is available. The other thing that, you know, is interesting, I, I think a lot of people thought the ruling would really address is the validity of the Nooksack in-stream flow rule, um, which is very similar to a bunch of other rules that were done in the um, 70s and 80s. Um, they did not, but they did actually, you know, kind of give a nod to which, which way they might go if they were forced to ask, you know, if, if this question was before them. And, you can see it here in the, you know, however the cooperative approach, and it was with ecology, does not allow counties to disregard evidence of minimum flow impairments in reliance on an outdated regulation. So that gave just some indication of, of where they're at with these, these rules and, and what the language says, and, and so we definitely paid attention to that. So giving all those kind of considerations that the county, um, formed their, uh, you know, did an analysis, talked to outside legal counsel, um, talked to, you know, met with our internal legal counsel, spoke with, uh, you know, a call with numerous prosecuting attorneys across the state. And, and, you know, the first thing was, you know, this is a GMA case. Why, why are we doing anything? Um, why not wait until we um, update our comp plans? And that's true, comp plans are actually deemed compliant until they're proven that they're not. And so you can rely on them. 
Um, and that's like for the case in King County, they have an extensive water availability determination, regulation, and approach. And so what this means is that that's deemed compliant until they in, until someone says it's invalid or they update it. Um, Spokane County has no such thing. We exclusively rely on 1927-097. There is no water availability piece in the Spokane County comp plan. We rely exclusively on state law and the Hearst decision explicitly changed the interpretation of 1927-097. And when that happens, it's binding on um, non-parties when the court issues the mandate. Now we would have a little more breathing room if someone actually would have filed for a motion for reconsideration because that would have pushed the timeline of the mandate, but that didn't happen. And so then we were um, you know, faced with uh, essentially what we, we did was say that in the Little Spokane River Basin, we need proof that you have legal water availability and a permit exempt well is not demonstration of that. We need you to have a water right. And, and prove that to us. And so that backdrop kind of sets the stage for where, you know, some of these legislative solutions that we've seen um, and what were, uh, you know, this certainly comes into play as we evaluate what we're doing with this water bank. And, you know, just so everybody knows on the water banking side, essentially what this means is, is that if someone needs a water right in a basin where there's none available, then the only way to get one is to purchase another, an existing one. And so you purchase it from someone that's willing to sell it, and then you repurpose it. So it's like the transaction of, of any type of um, property within, um, you know, in the market. And so when a person gets a piece of that water right, then they now have the proof that they have legal availability. And so when we look at the 5239 and, and look about, you know, do we need to continue with this water bank and what happens when the legislature starts to address this issue? When we looked at 5239, we did see some some positives. Um, it did alleviate the county of the responsibility to have, evaluate impairment. Um, it does beg the question of then who inherits that liability? Does that transfer onto somebody else? Um, because we still have the, the issue that you're impairing a senior water right. Um, and then it also allows reliance on ecology rules, but we were you know, fairly concerned that that was gonna bring Hearst 2.0 and we're gonna start litigating all the language in those rules. And with the nod from the court that they considered an outdated regulation, we we're concerned that, and especially because the Little Spokane is the first rule and it was um, very inarticulate in, ha in how it was implemented or, or written. And so, you know, especially when it says, all rights hereafter are established shall be expressly subject to the base flows. Other, uh, other rules started to say all permitted rights or all, you know, they are, but this one just brings in the whole ball of wax and says all rights hereafter. Um, and then the other thing is the very first two rules that were written did not provide blanket exemptions. They only exempted people from the closures and tributary basins. Now we're kind of getting to inside baseball here, but that means that potentially you could be exempted from the closure but still responsible to meet the base flow and then you still have an issue. Um, and I guess it really comes down to that foundational principle that um, first in time is first in right and you cannot impair a senior water right. And so really the way of addressing that is to create a domestic priority. And um, the very first version of 5239 did include that and it's, it's right here when it says a groundwater withdrawal that is exempt from the requirement to obtain a permit from the department may not be deemed or considered to cause impairment or injury to a base flow, minimum flow or minimum level. So that really would have elevated a domestic use above an in-stream flow and had done it in, in, the, um, in the law. So that would have, that would have been very difficult. Although 
we still have tribal issues when you get to that because um, they have the water rights that are time immemorial and are very first in line. So that is still an issue. So when we saw that language was removed within a, you know, the Senate Republican committee, um, we thought that if it was removed from the first version in that setting, then it, it really is a political non-starter. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, how it got removed or why. Um, but it was that that, you know, when we saw that get removed, it was, we thought, you know, we really need a backup plan. And that's what the water bank really was. Um, and it's a plan that can, first of all, in the face of no legislative action, will allow properties owners to build. And then it will also, um, in the face of a, a, a fix that goes into place but then gets litigated, will have some certainty for property owners. Um, you know, and it, really all it does is a water bank puts the property owner that purchases the purchases that mitigation certificate, it basically says you are not subject to that rule. You are now not subject to the rule. So it's all, everything is, you, you know, you don't have to adhere to that. Um, the other consideration when we had when we were doing the, creating the water bank, because we're spending, you know, taxpayer resources is that um, if a domestic priority did make it into state law and we didn't need that, that water right is still has a lot of value. Um, and you're able to sell it to somebody else who's going to uh, make an industrial use of it. Um, and so it wasn't money down the drain by any stretch. Um, how much then, money? How much money for the water right? We have, um, it's about, well, we paid by, by the acre foot, $2,770 an acre foot, and it was 250 foot acre water right that we've um, had the purchase and sale agreement on and so it was seven hundred and some thousand dollars. Um, the other reason was that as the democratic proposals rolled out they were very complicated, onerous, and it put a lot of responsibility on the Department of Ecology and, and we felt like we could implement a solution that was more efficient, quicker, and so we really prefer a, a local solution with some sort of state assistance. Um, so th that's, that's really where, why the water bank um, is, has been the, the solution that we've been um, working towards. So just to, just to give a quick overview of how the water bank works, you know, a property owner needs a water right to develop a property now, and so we are just prevent, providing that opportunity for them to purchase a water right. What does that cost? The, the water bank we're developing right now, we're still evaluating the cost. It'll be just a, a cost recovery program. And it's we're estimating between two and $4,000. We're still working on the quantity of water that will be sold with each um, certificate. But you know, that's, that's the, the um, kind of the price range we're looking at. Um, Water rights are bought and sold all the time. Yakima River Basin has a very vibrant water market. Um, here in um, in the Little Spokane River Basin, water rights get bought and sold. I was aware of a um, water right, a person wanted to develop a golf course up near uh, Riverside. He purchased a water right that was um, adjacent to him. He repurposed it and now has a, uh, uses it for his golf course. Um, Stevens PUD, I know, purchased a water right to supply for potential industrial development in Clayton. The problem with those is those are one-to-one, -one, one large water use to another wa large water use. And so there is really no practical way for an individual to do that. Um, so that's what the water bank serves to do, is just reduce the transaction costs and make it a, 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 the, give the opportunity to an individual to buy a small piece. Um, you know, most individuals aren't going to be able to buy even a modest size water right. You know, uh, maybe it's 20 acre feet, which would end up being, you know, $50,000. Um, so the water right is the water bank. We, you know, this is the water right we have a purchase and sale agreement for. Um, it's actually located up in this area. It was a 100 acre alfalfa farm. The person wanted was 
contacted us. We, you know, we they we sent out some letters inquiring about their water right, and they called us right up and said, "Yeah, we were planning on uh, subdividing this land. We don't envision needing the water. We'd rather, you know, but we know it has value. They they've been using the water for." Uh, quite a long time have had to maintain the irrigation equipment have you know they've put a lot of effort into maintaining that water right and so they're selling it to us to repurpose it and then the water then will be shifted from an agricultural use to domestic uses within the same vicinity <laughs> and really how this this works is that <clears throat> this person has a water right they pump 500 gallons a minute out of this well we purchase the water right, they stop pumping that water. Um, by not pumping that water, more water goes into the surface water. And so you have this consumptive water use that now goes into the in-stream flow bucket. Now we have more in-stream flow. And then now because the presumption is that new groundwater uses will now um, uh, have an impact on that in-stream flow, we've built up a certain amount of in the bank and now we can withdraw from it and then you have a net no change in the water balance and then there's also the um, as you go into this you're developing a, the bank and you're determining where exactly this is you know all based on hydrogeologic evaluation where can you start a new use that has a similar impact as to the one where you stopped and so what this will give people is the you know a, a certificate that allows them to be considered above the um, ahead in line as the in-stream flow <coughs> because it's quite clear that um, if you have a priority date ahead of the in-stream flow then you're there's no problems right now on the Spokane River they just set an in-stream flow um, and the city of Spokane could double their water use and still be within their water rights. And we've done modeling of the impacts of that. That would reduce the Spokane River about 200 CFS in the summertime. They could do that without, even though there's an in-stream flow, because they're senior to it, they could reduce the river almost in half from the pumping of their aquifer. Um, so there's no doubt that a person that has a water right ahead of an in-stream flow is is in a good position and so that's really what we're offering through this water bank okay that's great you done that's it i am done okay you're handing the microphone over to josh all right and i'll fix the cords so we don't knock over the water thank you thank you so um uh, M Mike, th thank you for for a very uh, very in depth analysis. Um, some of the things, I mean, my my comments are going to be short here. I mean, Mike Mike hit on uh, on, a, on a great deal of information for you there. Um, right off right off the bat, we, we as a county, we we are in support of, of Senator Warnick's bill, and so I'm I'm going to let you explain what the bill does. I don't, I don't want to because I. I don't want to steal what, what you're going to say, but um, we we are in support of that legislation. Uh, we we've shared with her um, amendments or changes that we'd like to see tweaks to that would help Spokane County. Uh, Commissioner French did a. Um, uh, um, uh, sort of a Skype in um, testimony in support of that bill when it was in committee in the Senate. Um, uh, also, one of the, you know right, right off the bat too, you know we at Spokane County we. We do not support the Hearst decision. We don't like it. It's not something we think is good. We understand that. We see that this is this is a bad decision. This hurts our property owners. Um, this this hurts economic development in the rural communities. We absolutely see that. We see that. Um, also, through all of our conversations, um, we as commissioners have been very clear. Uh, at no point with this water bank do we ever. Um, intend to require metering. I know that's something that I've heard a lot of people ask about. No, at no point do we intend to allow metering to come into the discussion here. Um, 
the um, uh, M- M- Mike touched on earlier about the the, the prices anywhere from two to four thousand. Um, that that uh, that's going to come down to uh, the cost of the uh, the water rights we re- that that we acquire, as well as factoring in the staff time that it takes to administer the water bank, and then that's how we will calculate the the cost. But we will not be profiting off of this. We we do not feel that that is, that would be appropriate for us to profit off of. You know, essentially, it's something terrible that the state has has inflicted on our citizens. We are not going to profit off of it. Um, but uh, we're um, there, we're still in discussions about the size of packages. We're looking at two possible packages to where essentially there you would have your um, your um, your usage for the domestic use and then usage for your landscaping you know, of the house and those those will be um, two, two different packages depending on gallons and we're still work trying to flush out the ideas excuse me yes if you don't meet her how do you know what to charge them so we have worked with um, a consulting company that has uh, worked with um, uh, establishing water banks across the country and one of the things that they say is it's a situation where there are going to be people that use more water than they're supposed to there's going to be people that use less and across the board it's usually a wash so um so it metering is, is something that that we have uh, incorporated into every everything that we have dealt with by saying no it so won't then be i there. guess the charge should just be standard across the board um well i can add a little bit yeah. if you want um our approach is to look at indoor use as just a residential use. We've built in a big safety factor in the amount we're going to tell Department of Ecology each certificate allows for, and so that it's it's more water than anybody could potentially use. So we debit the bank that amount, and then they, and then we just say because we've been so conservative in our estimate, we don't need to meter it. The outside use is the consumptive use is not really dependent on how much water you actually use outside. It's really dependent on how much you're growing. If you're growing a certain amount of of outdoor uh, landscape, then you could water it till the cows come home and um, and all that water that wasn't used by the plant is going to go back in to the ground and into the aquifer. And so that amount of water is not counted as debited against the bank and so there is a limitation on the amount of outside irrigation that will be be associated with these mitigation certificates but it's all based on consumptive use all of the amount of water that returns to the system via septic is not part of the mitigation certificate Um, all of the water that returns back to the ground when you're out irrigating outdoor you're not paying for that Um, it's just the consumptive use and that's what allows us to get so many homes from one agricultural right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know what? One of the other things too. Um, you know that there's. Yeah. You know, I, again, I just want to. I, I want to clear up some of the things. Uh, some of the questions that folks have asked me. Um, because I, I'm sure you, you folks have that have some of the same questions. Um, you know, I've a lot of people have approached me and and said that um, that they're hearing that Spokane County is taking these water rights from people to establish this water bank. You know, as Mike showed in his presentation, these have all been purchased and these have been from willing sellers. Under no circumstance have we approached any owner and said, you must sell this to us. You know, that, that, is, that is not part of this. Um, you know, the, you know our, our, main, our main focus is we know that there are, there are property rights uh, in Wira 55 and we want to help those the, the, those property owners with their property rights. Um, there was a study that came out, uh, I believe, um, yesterday or, or early this morning, from the uh, associate um, the uh, Building Industry Association of Washington (BIAW), and th- these are statewide numbers. But I'm going to read through some of these to show you the impact that this is having statewide with this Hearst decision. Um, Six point nine billion dollars. Uh, lost in economic activity each year is what they're estimating because of this Hearst decision in Washington State. Uh, 452.3 million of lost employee wages due to the impact of Hearst. Um, Nearly 9,300 jobs lost in rural Washington because of the Hearst decision. Um, uh, The um, four $0.59 billion 
um, losses to the construction industry. And we, we, we have heard from builders, we have heard from homeowners that want to use their property the way they see fit, and we understand that the Hearst decision makes that impossible for them in certain areas of, of our community. Um, we view the, you know, do, would we love to see a, a fix come out of Olympia that makes all this go back to the way it was? Yes. But this, uh, this water bank, uh, essentially right now is acting Kim. as an insurance policy for us. Kim. You know, we, we know we've got two rock stars right here at the table with us that are going to fight tooth and nail to get that fix. But if we're not able to get it through the legislature, this water bank is what's going to allow people to put a well on their property and build their homes. That's, that's really where, where we're at here. So, thank you. Super. Thank you, Josh. And now to Senator Warnick. Are you good there? Okay. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation um, tonight. I actually started in Mount Vernon this morning. Ooh. I attended a um, farm tour uh, yesterday, stood on the bank of a river there, and looked at the river that was almost high tide, not quite, flowing very, very well. And the farmers across the bank couldn't get any water from that river because of a decision that was made in that county. So the irrigators in that county were completely left out. So we're fighting for that as well. Um, and I've been um, on the road all day. I will finish or, or um, include some of the comments that the governor made. I met with him in Afreda uh, this afternoon and then raced up here. So <laughs> um, I, don't under, I don't have any uh, um, idea what an interim looks like. We are not technically in session. Um, but I bought a car the first part of the summer and it was new and it's already got almost 11,000 miles on it. So um, it's, uh, it's been back and forth over those mountains a number of times. I really appreciate hearing from Mike. Um, not every county in the state has the resources that Spokane County has and to have your own water resource manager is is incredible and and I know you haven't figured it all out yet but um, it was I always learn something when I come to these and I've I've learned quite a bit from Mike um, the introduction of 5239 was done at the request of a number of stakeholders, especially people who had a piece of property and now they're told that they cannot drill a well. Um, or they could drill a well, but they couldn't build a house with the water from that well. I represent Lincoln County, I represent most of Grant County, all of Kittitas County, and a little bit of Yakima County. So the headwaters of the Yakima River Basin starts in Kittitas County. Kittitas County, as was uh, explained earlier, has been forced into the water banking um, uh, solution uh, by the Department of Ecology and a lawsuit uh, that was filed in 2007. Uh, thousands of dollars, lots of uh, discussions on how to get there. And Kittitas County has water. Um, and there was water available for a water bank. It was not necessarily agriculture water. We have a fairly large development up in Upper County called Suncadia. Before they could develop, they were required to purchase more water than they needed. And so now that they know how much water they need for their development, there was water available. Other developers had purchased uh, water rights. And so the county ended up buying. Now I don't know what they paid for it. Um, and I believe it's two, three, four thousand for the individuals when they want to buy water rights for their 
uh, for their development, their own homes. Um, but uh, Mike said something about it could be coming to a county near you, and I said that exact same thing when that happened. Um, because that's the way people have been working. Um, I know it was said earlier that the original lawsuit was filed by FutureWise. Um, a lot of tribes um, also weighed in on that. And I thought the most ironic um, statement that I heard this summer was by our Public Lands Commissioner, Hillary Franz. We need the capital budget passed because I need to fix the forest because <laughs> of the wildfires. And I, I called her. I said, Hillary, help us out. Help us fix this. Well, I'm not involved in that anymore. And I said, I know. But um, the only way we are still talking about Hearst, and I'm going to go into a little bit of the politics of it. It's been covered pretty well. Uh, the whys, why it came this way, but the only reason we're still talking about Hearst is because leadership in my caucus said we're not going to do a, pass a capital budget unless we pass the Hearst bill. Um, I have been, um, I, my first year in the House was 2007. I have never traded a bill. I've never said, I'll do this if you do this. So this has been a really difficult year for me. Um, but I told our caucus June 30th or July 1st, really early in the morning when things fell apart, I think that was the right thing to do. Uh, in fact, we asked some of the folks that we were negotiating with. Um, we had a five corner meeting in, in August and five corner means representatives from both parties, from both the House and Senate. We had the governor's staff in there and we had the director of ecology in there. And the question was, if we had passed the capital budget, would we be talking about Hearst? And the answer was no. Um, so it's, I think it was the right thing to do to, to uh, not pass the capital budget. But um, we are dealing with a very unique situation in Olympia. The Senate has a one vote majority, one vote majority. The Senate, it's called the Majority Coalition Caucus, so it's Republicans and one moderate Democrat who has joined us. So one vote isn't much. And, um, and then the House is a two vote majority and then uh, by Democrats, and then we have a Democrat governor. So the reason we took out that section five was political. Um, we knew we couldn't get that through. The, the Senate Ag, Water, Rural, or Trade and Economic Development Council, or the committee, I can't even say the name anymore, includes a tribal member. Uh, we have a senator who is uh, a Tulalip member, and he's very, very tough, very tough to get passed. And so talking with him, we knew that if the bill passed the Senate, uh, with that in there, uh, there's no way we could get it past the House. So we did take that out. And now, fast forward, the bill has passed on a bipartisan level four times, four times from the Senate. The first one, the original bill, came back and each special session, uh, we passed it again and it was with Democrat votes. The second uh, member on the bill uh, is Senator Dean Tacco. And he's, he's a Democrat, he's a moderate Democrat. So it was a bipartisan bill to start with. Um, and we passed it bipartisan. But we couldn't even get, um, the bill out of the House Ag and Water Committee. He gave us a hearing. Um, I respect the chair of that committee. He's a moderate, uh, Representative Brian Blake. Um, but he could not pass that bill out of committee. Uh, he was told by his leadership, don't do it. So every time we have a, a new special session, all the bills that are um, and it goes back to the House of Origin, bills that have not been passed from both houses. So it, it's been bipartisan. June 30th, we had a 
um, a glimmer of hope. We had a bipartisan amendment that we thought the tribes were going to agree to, the environmentalists were going to agree to, the governor indicated he was going to agree to it. But that evening, that's the end of our uh, first special session, that evening I looked out the doors of our uh, chamber and I looked down at the outside doors of the House chamber on the Democrat side. There was probably about 30 tribal representatives standing outside that door and a few environmental representatives. Huge pressure. Um, the governor had indicated he was going to go with what we had. And um, huge pressure, all of a sudden, Bill didn't come forward. So we lost that opportunity. Uh, we've had another special session since then, ended July 20th, and nothing. Just no ideas. The, uh, there was a mention of Democrat bills, de Democrat ideas. The main idea they have put out is, let's do a temporary fix. Let's do one for um, 18 months, maybe two years, maybe five years. Well, a temporary fix isn't going to do it. Um, I mentioned I was in Skagit County. There's 452 homes up there that were given um, permission to drill a well, build a home, while there was a court case pending. Now those 452 homes don't have legal access to water. The chair of the Swinomish tribe that uh, filed the lawsuit told me, well, we're letting them use the water. I don't know what's going to happen when they want to sell their house, uh, when they maybe want to expand, or when the tribe gets tired of letting them use their water. Uh, because that was, that was the uh, impetus for the lawsuit, was the tribes felt that they were, their rights were being infringed upon. I don't want to see that happen to the rest of the state, so I fought the temporary uh, fix. And then the banks came out and said, we're not going to loan. We're not going to process mortgages on a temporary fix. Um, we have to make sure that the homes that we're loaning money on have legal access to water or have a way to get water. Um, and I applaud Spokane County for, for looking at this. I know we're going to hear the other side in a few minutes, but I do applaud their attempt to look at this because I'm not sure we can get it done. Uh, huge pressure um, to, um, to get this passed, um, but it's, uh, there's also a lot of pressure to pass the capital budget. And this has been our, our ace. This has been what keeps the, the Hearst dis discussions going. Um, the uh, governor came to Efreda. It's a little town. Efreda has a public works project that's in the capital budget that they want to coordinate with the Department of Transportation. Department of Transportation has a highway that comes through the middle of Efreda. They want to coordinate that, and they can't do it. So they've had to put that project on hold. They want to put new septic uh, lines and water lines through the center of Efreda. And uh, so the governor was going to come, or he did come, and he said, it's all the Republicans' fault for putting this this project on hold. And I reminded him, no, we need the, we need the capital budget. We also need this uh, Hearst bill to be passed um, for our rural residents, for people who live just outside of Efreda, who have kids that go to school in Efreda, who uh, have jobs in Efreda. And there's multiple other small communities that uh, are counting on, on the rural um, development to, to help with those small communities. Um, what, what Spokane's doing isn't the answer for everyone. What Kittitas did isn't the answer for everyone. What uh, Walla Walla has done, there's a uh, collaboration there that includes some water banks and, and other uh, opportunities. So we tried not to, to fix all the problems all at once. We couldn't fix Foster. We couldn't fix um, it, some of the, the Skagit ruling. The Swinomish ruling, we couldn't fix all of those. We were just trying to go back and, and fix the, 
domestic well issues. Now you have, um, I want to thank the city, uh, the Spokane Valley City Council for their support of this bill. Um, they did a resolution about the day after or the day before the Spokane City Council uh, opposed the opposed the bill, so it's interesting just seeing in this little area the differences um, in in support or non-support. Um, the uh, governor today, I I had sent a letter out with 21 signatures. I don't think he even saw it yet, but uh, he was visiting, like I said, to put pressure on Republican districts. He's been going all over. Um, he thinks the only way to fix it is temporarily, um, and has tried talking my my constituents into supporting his temporary fix. He didn't win any points uh, in the Freda because I've talked to them enough. Even the city manager, the city council um, understands why we've had to hold up on the capital budget. And, you know, just by the way, get a little political here. He was planning on coming to a Freda for about the last 10 days. We didn't know about it officially until yesterday after four o'clock wow. and I was in Skagit. So, uh, but the manager of Efreda had called me last week and said, we want you there, we want that balance. And so we were able to do that, um, be there and, and do a point counterpoint with the governor. Um, the, um, <clears throat> let's see if there's anything else. I've got notes, things happen all so quickly. Um, our uh, um, meeting in August, the five corner meeting, uh, included the, the, the House D's, House uh, Republicans and Senate Republicans included the governor. We decided, we didn't remember when from June 30th to August 9th, exactly what we had decided, what we had agreed upon in the negotiations. So we said, okay, we're gonna go back. This is what we agreed on, this is what we agreed on. We traded that paper. And then I told the House Democrats, we have made a lot of movement. We've, we've passed the bill four times, we've listened, we've changed it somewhat, and it's your turn to make the next move. They have not done that. I talked to Representative Larry Springer um, on a very regular basis, at least two times a week. I talked to him yesterday. I was crawling through his district on 405, and so I thought, I'm gonna give him a call. And he said, no, we don't have any ideas yet. So um, it's just very, very frustrating. I sent the letter from 21 senators to the governor this morning and said, you need to take the lead. You need to be a leader. I've worked with two governors now and have heard stories of other governors who do lead. If the legislature becomes at an impasse, it's the time for the governor to step in, and he has not done that. He's listened to special interest groups, and he's not really sat down uh, with us and, and tried to re reach a, uh, an agreement. So. I would like if you could put up. I brought. Hopefully, pass it comes her the uh, clicker. Okay, I think there's only two. There it is. Um, this is the study that Josh was talking about. Sorry. No, <laughs> I think people need to hear it more than once. Um, the capital budget, the total capital budget, and this is a full two-year capital budget. Uh, the total is $4 billion. I want you to look at that first number up there. On an annual basis, 6.9 billion economic loss of economic activity. 6.9 billion. And this was, not a this was a study that was commissioned by Building Industry of Washington, um, but it wasn't done by them. It's a 68-page study. Um, you should be able to find it online, um, but I didn't feel like I could bring 68 pages and make sense out of it tonight. But I think this summary is, is exactly what we need to see. 
452.3 million in lost employee wages. And that counts the builders, counts the people who may have jobs in rural areas if the employers will come there. 9,000 lost jobs. Uh, FTEs, that's full employ full time employees. Uh, lost taxes, 392.7 in lost taxes to state and local governments annually. That's um, sales taxes. 4.9 billion in losses to construction industry. Just the construction industry. And then this is the part that we all need to pay attention is these last two numbers. 37 billion in lost property values in areas impacted by Hearst. This isn't statewide, it's just the impact, the rural areas impacted by Hearst. And then finally, 346 million in property taxes shifted to other property owners in Washington. That's you and me, if we have, if we have uh, property, and I do, I live uh, outside of Moses Lake on a farm with a exempt well. Um, my brother still has our family farm in Deer Park with an exempt well. So the, the tax shift is going to come to those of us who have property. If the value of the properties that people have invested in with the idea they're going to build on it, um, if those values go down, then the rest of us are going to have to pay. And um, I just can't uh, can't support that. That's why I'm working so hard on on getting this done. It's um, I'll be glad to answer any questions, but I just want to thank before I hand this off to Jacqueline. I want to thank her seatmate or or her colleague in the House, Representative David Taylor. Um, he has been with us all the way. He's been negotiating with us. And he has been fantastic. Um, he has a background in management, in growth management, which has been um, a huge help to us, so especially to those of us that haven't had that background. And uh, the House Republicans have been, we're getting, the, we're getting the criticism, but the House Republicans have been uh, very, very um, helpful and stand with us. The other thing I want to say, I walked in when uh, uh, Bob McCaslin was talking, and I just want to send out my thoughts and prayers to the families that were impacted by the school shooting today. My company in Moses Lake um, is right across the street from Frontier Middle School. Uh, we had a shooting in that school well over 20 years ago. It was about 25 years ago. Um, one of my current employees was in the classroom where the shooting took place. The teacher was shot, uh, several students were shot, and thanks to a coach who had the um, courage to go in and stop the shooter. It, but that, that young man was going to take everybody out that day. Um, our, our community has been healing ever since, but we never get over it. And the young lady that works for me now, she has to take the rest of the day off every time she hears about a school shooting because of the flashbacks. So it, you never get over it. Um, and I just want to send my thoughts and prayers to all these families and, and just hope that we can get through it and not have too many of those because it's, it's devastating. It's a tragedy when a young person does this. So thank you again for inviting me and I'll be open for questions and try to answer them. Right, we'll be doing questions and answers when we're through here, so we'll, so, I'm gonna so be up. prepared. I've been sitting a lot, so if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna stand. Um, so uh, I'm Jacqueline Maycumber, I'm the state representative of the 7th Legislative District, so North Spokane up to um, Stevens County, Ponderay County, Okanagan County, part of Okanagan County and Ferry County. Um, I have to stand because I've been on a mine tour and I've been traveling a lot for two days so I've been uh, bouncing back and forth and I need to kind of stretch it all out. Plus we have an amazing panel and I'm kind of like the newbie so I'm kind of bringing it all back to like, you know, non-polished language. So I'm just going to tell you this morning I 
got ready to go for a run and my husband goes, I want to say something to you. And I don't bring work home because I have a biochemistry degree and so I did biomedical research and my husband's not a biochemist so I never explained anything to him. And then I was a cop so I couldn't explain anything to him. And now I'm a legislator and he doesn't want me to explain anything to him. So that's my marriage in a nutshell. And um, he says, I have something to say to you. And I said, all right, because you know, I'm got, you know, about eight hours of sleep in two days, so I'm joyful and happy. And he says, um, you know, when you get, when you die and you get to the St. Peter's Gate, I was like, okay. And he goes, what, what's going to happen is they're going to say, Jacqueline, were you joyful? And I'm going to, you're going to say yes. And they're going to say, Jacqueline, did you give joy? And you're going to say, mm-hmm. And they're going to say, Jacqueline, did you do good? And you're going to say, mm-hmm. And then he goes, and you know what you're going to say? And I, no, I'm, what, what am I going to say? And he goes, you're going to say, what about Hearst? <laughs> right? <laughs> that, that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that. And I went, w I don't talk to you about it. And he goes, I watch the news. I see it on your face. I know what's happening. And so to have my husband reflect that back on me, someone that I don't talk to about it, I went, yeah, what about Hearst? So we have tons of information, and then there's me, right? What, what else can I add? So I'm just going to kind of bring it back to brass tacks right here. Um, Hearst is not a water decision. It is not made on the water law. Very basic. It is made on the GMA and on a building code. So it's really nice to have all this information. Now you know what the counties are doing and, and why we're fighting, but it is not a water law. You want to open up water law? I will be happy to open up water law. I'll open up the municipality's water law, and we'll look at Seattle. I will do that all day long. <clears throat> so it's not water law. It's control. That's right. So I'm not going to I'm not going to argue, I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to I'll pull RCWs. It is control. Absolutely control. So I'm going to go ahead and say something that's going to get me in trouble, but I'm new and I'm going to pull that card for like 5 more years, okay? If that's okay <laughs> with you. Um, right now, this is a multi-generational decimation of rural Washington. And just in case there is a reporter here, which I'm sure there is, I'm going to say it again. It's a multi-generational decimation of rural Washington. That's all it comes down to. It has nothing to do with fish. It has nothing to do with water. Because if that was the case, Seattle would not be building 12,000 new units. Because I was just over there, and I just met with them, and they're building 12,000 new units, and they are not paying for their water. Don't let them tell you they're paying for their water because they're not paying for the water. They're paying for the infrastructure to bring the water down. They're not paying for water. So when you talk exempt wells, the reason why we say exempt wells, the reason why we use that word is the Department of Ecology own study says exempt wells are exempt because we cannot measure what they pull from the aquifer. They're 1%. So I'm just going to tell you about a little meeting I had with the governor's office, and it was great. So I'm in negotiations all session with Hearst, right? I'm one of the Republicans, and they really want to meet with me alone. You know, it's a really, you know, when you've been there a while, you know the codes. Okay, come meet with me alone, you know. Well, Jacqueline, we, we have some options, and we just want to present them to you first, and then we'll go to everybody else, you know, in a group. And you know what that is. They're trying to peel you off. And okay, okay, well, what do you got? Okay, we'll give you 5,000 gallons per day. O we'll only meter wells that are, you know, put in now. And then, um, you know, it'll give you options, and then we'll have a pay scale and blah, blah, blah. And then, so I do this thing called active listening because I used to be a cop. I'm so sorry I use it on everybody, so you've all probably gotten used on it. So I start talking. I'm like, well, what are we going to do in the future? And you start listening to as of now or when we, and you look at these words that they start using, and then we get down to, well, what we're looking for is about 325 gallons per day per family. You know that 5,000 gallons per day at the beginning of the meeting was an offer as they led to, 20 to 325 gallons per day. Now, kind of put it in perspective, we're apparently not having children, okay? So, because um, I need to wash their clothes. And so I listen to this, you know, and I draw it out and I get, okay, there's the facts. And I go, um, so I thought the governor was an environmentalist. Right? I mean, like, I have a biochem degree. I speak your language. You know, what do you got? I thought he was an environmentalist. And he was, he is. He's the best, you know. Okay, yeah, I get his run for president. I get it. Okay, 2020, whatever. Uh, no, he's the best. He's an environmental uh, governor. And I said, well, if that's the case, then when you grow a tomato in your backyard, 
you're not putting a big carbon footprint on that food, are you? But when you buy it from the grocery store from Mexico, it is hauled up through the United States and delivered. So if you're an environmentalist, you would say, give them the water, let it be exempt, it will return back to the aquifer, and they can grow their own garden, grow their own food, and their carbon footprint will be less. If you are an environmentalist, you would say homestead. Right? That seems pretty logical to you and I because it has nothing to do with water, right? Bring it back again. It has nothing to do with water. It has nothing to do with allowing us to grow our food. It has nothing to do with the environment and it has everything to do about control because guess what? Guess what our districts are, especially on this panel. Guess what our districts are? They're a park for the I-5 elite. <laughs> that's what they are they are not our our land to do what we want with you know they're not you know our our you know our ranches our agriculture they're a park for the i5 elite because they're looking at each other going well we really messed this up let's let's look, look over there right they're litigating us out of liberty that's right we are being litigated out of our own land right now. And somebody said something to me today, actually the legislator that was here later, or earlier, he said, you know, we're voting over here on the West Side at like 93%, and you guys are voting at like 60s. If you guys started voting, you could take control. Amen. I don't know why he needed to tell me that. I was like, oh, I know, I know. And, and you know, that's the, they're seeing, th seeing that over there, right? So they're litigating us out of our liberty. They're taking our land, and they're saying, well, you know, that's our park. And the water that flows underneath it is our chess piece in a political climate change game. And it has nothing to do with water and it has nothing to do with the environment. So we need to constantly bring this back and put it in perspective. So right now, while we're having these conversations, we're talking about this, and it looks really dire, right? I'm, I'm kind of like the end of a really depressing movie. That's what I am right now. It's kind of, that's why I had to stand. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna say now? We're standing on the edge of the last line of liberty, aren't we? What you just heard today that was really depressing. That was really depressing. And when we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we can survive the pursuit of happiness, right? We can survive not being happy because our ancestors, they, they may not have been happy in some of those generations, let's be honest. And we can survive liberty because we'll fight for it. But we can't survive life. And that's what we're talking about today, and that's water. That's it. We're, and that's why my husband said that, because he went, you're going to die going, well, what about Hearst? What about life? I will fight for my liberty, and I will make my own happiness, but get out of my way for life. Get out of my way for life. And that's what's happening today, right? We're talking about it, and so we need to get out there and fight. We know we talk about all these elections, and we need to get out there and talk about it. I want to put this one of these in perspective. And, and everybody, you know, took everybody's smoke. And I'm, I, I memorize everything. So I read this, and I just got mad on my way down while I was driving. So when we talk about $37 billion in lost property values impacted by Hearst, I, I kind of want to put this in a big perspective. You know, was our biennium budget $47 billion? for two years, right? The full budget, full budget for two years is $47 billion and we just lost $37 billion in lost property values. Who wins? Let's talk about these like groups that buy up land and you know, make sure you know, it's a park for people to drive and see. Doesn't really do anything because there's no more ag on it because you sold your 39, 29, 19 water to your water bank because that's what happens. There's no more ag, right? There's no houses on it, but you get to drive by and look at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, not that, you know, not that I'm arguing with that, but this is what their perspective is. So we are losing almost our biennium state budget. If that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what does. So Representative Coster and I wrote a bill this year because we could see this coming, okay? We wrote a bill, I believe it's 2195. 
Somebody has to look it up for me. $295 or $294, both my bills. Anyway, the bill was to say, listen, counties, you need to reassess because us as business owners, because by the way, business owners are going to be the one too that are going to be paying these lost values and property owners. We're going to have to make up these lost values of these properties because if I was a landowner and I can't drill a well anymore, I'm going to tell you, no, I'm not going to pay those taxes at $100,000. I'll pay you what it's worth, nothing, right? And you have that right. You go to your board of equalization and say, I'm not going to pay it anymore, right? Reassess. So we wrote legislation that says you need to reassess and they featured it in the Seattle Times. You know why? Because I think King County has some rural lots. When you live in King County and have your lot next to you, that property's worth like $300,000 without, you know, developed property, right? And that landowner next door is going to have to pay for that. So they featured it in the Seattle Times and they were like, you know, maybe these counties should reassess and maybe the state should help. So I said, well, we're not getting anywhere with this. You know, the bill didn't go anywhere, blah, blah. So I said, well, I'm going to write a budget amendment. And so under the takings law, so you know when you talk about in a dom intimate domain and to no fault of your own, your property's made worthless by the government. It's pretty close to what we're talking about here. You have a right to seek damages, right? You did nothing. Your property's worth nothing now. You have a right to seek damages. So I wrote a me amendment to the budget that said, you know, individuals, 37 billion worth of lost property should be able to seek damages. And, I, and my sergeant always said, you never come with a problem without a solution. So I said, I know exactly where to find it. It's under the Department of Ecology's Clean Air Act and it's 4.6 million. Obviously, I, I really lowballed that. I really thought, <laughs> well, that didn't go anywhere. Although I think that it should have been the first thing taken because you have a right to seek damages to no fault of your own, right? This litigation. So we really need to talk about where we're going to go in the future and how we're going to fight. Because it's not just the land, right? It's pretty easy to take the water through litigation. And it's not going to be just the water. It's whether or not our children can come home and can innovate, can make our communities better, can develop. To, I mean, when we talk about when families grow and they create something, do something, things get better in the community, right? Your kids come back and they come up with these great ideas or they take over the family business or they do this. And right now, we can't do anything. We are literally being held by litigation. And it's going to continue. We have to fight. So when we talk about McCleary, <laughs> okay, I'm just, I'm not going to get into that. McCleary is now based on your property taxes. Basic education is now based on your property taxes, which sounds great until you get a tax shift because the government litigated out your own liberties of your neighbor and you have to pay that tax shift and now you have to pay your current levy in 2018 and then the McCleary levy. What's going to happen to our rural schools when our values decline? What's going to happen? Who's going to live out there to pay those values? Who? Who could possibly, well, you know, there are a group of people that make tons of money and have second homes in my district, right? Right? It's not a park. It's our right and it's our liberty to be able to live there, be able to have businesses there, and be able to do what we can do, right? To thrive and to flourish, that is our right. So my job, I'm new. Once again, I'm gonna use that for five more years. My job is to deliver the facts to you, right? Not, you tell me your opinion and how you feel. And then I go fight like hell in Olympia to make sure it happens for you. <laughs> That's my job. My job is to make sure I fight for you. I'm not making friends, I can tell you that. <laughs> I'm not making very many friends. And that's okay, because I'm not there to make friends. My job is to fight for you. So let me know what you want. Call me, tell me, let's get together, let's make it happen, let's keep going. Without Senator Warnick, we wouldn't even be in the position we'd be right now. We would be in big trouble right now. 
So thank you, Senator Work Warnett, for staying strong and being over there in Olympia and away from your family as, as long as you have. We could not do that without her. So we need to continue to call your legislators and keep up the fight because we have to make sure that we are involved in all the elections, that we are involved in the judicial branch, and that we get this under control because we're not going to be, we're not winning from here. It's going to be a litigated out of liberty. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to remind you all that the fundraiser for Shelley and Jackie, Jacqueline uh, is Wednesday, October 4th. Do you think she needs to be retained in the 7th? Yeah. And when you uh, Google her, it's May Cumber, C-U-M-B-E-R. You can find a nice donate page. Support this lady. We need more like her. She's a fireball. And now we will hear from Russell, who's also a fireball. Okay. Not so much tonight, but um, <laughs> I really appreciate everything I've heard so far, and I've learned a little bit about the way it's working here in Washington State from listening to all of these panelists, and I appreciate that. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time down in California, which is, if you know anything about California and water, they have serious arguments over water all the time. And I spent quite a bit of money recently going down there and um, working with some couple of organizations down there who have been fighting this. And I'm going to outline that a little bit. But I'm going to stick right to my notes because we don't have a lot more, lot more time here. So I want to try to shorten this as much as possible. But um, first thing I tell people in Washington State is there's no water crisis. There is no water crisis, and I think Jacqueline really outlined that well. There is no water crisis. We've got lots of water. We do have people in certain areas, obviously, that have well issues, but, you know, that's the risk when you buy property. And uh, that's something important to understand. Um, but to really understand what happened here with Hearst and how it's going to affect us now, I believe you have to go back to the GMA again, which Cecily mentioned earlier. So I'm, since I'm last, some of this may be a little redundant, but not completely. Um, Governor Booth Gardner, inside the GMA, I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but inside the GMA policy, he installed um, attachment points that would allow the environmentalists later to form more litigation. And that's essentially taking a shortcut real fast. That's basically what brought us to Hearst because that was all set up for them to be able to do that. And inc incredibly, you know, they set up a system where they could continue to create litigation. And what Jacqueline said is absolutely accurate. I was real pleased to hear it. Because um, I didn't have any idea what she was going to say, but you know, I'm really pleased with what I heard. I really am. And um, the litigation is litigation is not law, and for but unfortunately, they have they use leverage. I'm, and I'm going to get off point here real fast because I teach political leverage a, as a, as an instruction, and I don't want to get off on that right now. We don't have time for that. But it's a very important subject if you really want to learn how to fight these things the way they did in California and won. They beat water banking in the county in California. Um, but again, the GMA is basically an open-ended instrument to continue this process, and now Hearst is an open-ended instrument to do the same thing again. Yep. They just keep adding to it. And unfortunately, the conservative, and it's not just conservatives, they're involved in this also. I've did a, quite a bit of research and talking to people about this from, on both sides. Um, first, uh, secondly, I want to talk a little bit about collusion. In the two trips I made to California, it was for a dual-purpose dual meeting uh, with the leadership of Freedom Force International, that's who I work for, um, to investigate the water bank employed down there. They were very instrumental in that county in defeating the water banking policy and they're handing out brochures now. Those are the brochures that will explain that in, in brief. Um, and of course we're all being briefed tonight. What I'm going to tell you tonight is just barely scratching the surface and I apologize for that but there's just not enough time. I did a pretty in-depth uh, analysis on it on Monday night and even that wasn't everything. So um, we're not going to have time for that, obviously. But uh, in San Luis Obispo County, they actually defeated it because of what they saw happen in Kern County when Steve Resnick, some of you may know that name, and some of the big corporate uh, um, conglomerates came in and started buying up the water rights. But they were buying them up a district, a water district at a time. 
they weren't just buying private wells, they were buying up entire districts at one time through collusion with the state. Well, the people in Obispo County found out what was going on, actually had some help from pe people inside the state and, and who actually were willing to sign affidavits about the collusion that was taking place inside the state government with these corporate, these corporate uh, environmentalists. And the state was allowing them to buy up these water districts for two to three hundred dollars an acre foot. How many of you know how much an acre foot of water is? It's, it's nope. about three hundred fifty-eight thousand eight hundred and some thousand. I won't get it exactly. Gallons of water. Okay, two to three hundred dollars an acre foot. That's nothing. But that's what they were doing. Then they were reselling it for up to five thousand dollars an acre foot. And, and so that, that was nothing but an, an incredible scam and a ploy. It's a criminal conspiracy. Let me call it what it is. It's a criminal conspiracy. And water banking in Washington State will be a criminal conspiracy also. It will be. And it, there's no way around it. It will it'll start out sounding pretty good. We're helping landowners get water. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've heard that before. Talk to the people who were dead now in the 1800s who had the same problem with water barons out in the West in the 1800s. There's a long history of this stuff. This is nothing new. This is not new. Um, it's, there's, an, there's the unenforceable factor. Uh, the real secret behind these activities is that there's no true enforcement behind any of it. That's why they use litigation as a hammer. That's what it's for. There's no true enforcement behind it. Nobody can make me sell my water rights, and they've already said that they're going to offer to buy them for now. For now. It won't be that way in the future. Because when things like this go on with legal, more litigation, things become familiar. They, they become normalized after a while. Next thing you know, there's a term, a technical term called as law. They become as law later, and then you will you will not have any water rights on any piece of private property. That's down the road, but that will happen if we let this go too far. That's what will happen. Um, but uh, there's three factors that I want to hit real quickly um, that I think we need to look at considering, considering the unenforceable factor is and how it will affect different people. But both Democrats and Republicans are both alarmed and, and are going to be damaged by the Hearst decision. Every Democrat I have spoke to in, in Stevens County is totally against the Hearst decision. Every Democrat. Because they're, they're, it's a rural area. They own land. They're like, what? Yeah, I said, you know, it's, this is not a Democrat-Republican issue, really, when it comes down to the landowner. It may be in, in the legislature, in the Senate, but here it's not. Down here where, the, where we walk on the earth, it's not a Democratic-Republican issue. It's, it's a freedom issue. It's an individual right issue. It's a property right issue. That's all it is. And we need to keep it that way. Um, number, number two, the issue bypassed the legislature and the Senate and went straight to the courts who are now making law without the authority to do so. Uh, one of the commissioners here in Spokane County in a recent CAPER meeting said um, the Supreme Court made this law. I, I watched him say it. It's on YouTube if you want to watch it. The Supreme Court made this law. Well, the first problem with that is courts can't make law. Courts cannot make law. Only our legislature can make law. Well, so why are they following it then? Because of political leverage. Again, I don't have time to get into that tonight. I wish I did. I could give you some good information on political leverage. I have a background in counterintelligence, and I can tell you exactly how that works. And it works very well. And they know how to use it. The conservatives and people like us are the ones that don't know how to use political leverage, and I'm sick about that, and I'd like to see more people learn to use it. Um, the global, number three, the global environmental proponents are realizing they, they now have the power to forge ahead without the legitimacy of real, the exercise of true law. Um, they're in a position now, after all these years of decades of the decline of liberty, decades of the decline of our government operations, that they feel like they have enough control over the system of litigation and enough people inside the government now in these, in these agencies, especially the agencies where there are unelected servants, that they feel like they have enough control over it now. They don't need the rest of the Democrats to help them. They don't need all of their people now. See, this is a change in dynamics, and this is dangerous. When you get to that level, they know they're like a racehorse on the straight stretch now. They, they're seeing the end of the tunnel right now, that they've almost got this thing. 
and that's a dangerous point to be at. And uh, we need to put a stop to that immediately. And they did in one county in California, but it's not over. I just got off the phone yesterday with um, the people down there, and the corporations and their attorneys are right back in there again trying to find a way around the, the people's vote because they don't care about the people's vote. Uh, Future-wise, the main conspirator has threatened to sue anyone who opposes this. I'm sure you heard that, but they threatened to sue. Well, see, that's leverage. That's a form of leverage. And some of our county commissioners were just banging their knees together over that because we confronted them. And, and that's ridiculous. They shouldn't be. But they are, and that's a real problem. Um, a representative of FutureWise also sits on the Spokane County Water Availability, Water Availability Board. Yeah, uh, yeah. They're everywhere. FutureWise has got people everywhere. They're all, they're all over the place. Um, and then I want to talk about, a little bit about the, uh, the, the criminal conspiracy a little bit. The Hearst case itself was completely fabricated and contrived by NGOs like FutureWise, and they were the main, they were the main player in this, the main actor, I should say. They're an actor. Both the representing attorney and the main plaintiff, Eric Hurst, are members of FutureWise. Both of them are. Well, I would have assumed that if the courts knew that, that there would have been some foul play called. But there wasn't. They went through with it anyway. Um, thus, you know, considering that, I don't believe our local governments are obligated to comply with criminal actions because that's a criminal conspiracy. Plain and simple. You couldn't get any more, a more clear example of a criminal conspiracy. But somehow now, because of all the legal loopholes and after decades and decades of this criminal conspiracy going on and on and on, and the way they leverage things now, people have gotten used to it. And county commissioners, for the most part, don't have the education or the training in how to combat those kind of things in the first place. They're not trained to do that. And I'm not, that's not a criticism. They're just not. And wh how many people are actually trained to deal with things like that? They're not trained for that. Um, for, the foreknowledge of water banking is one of the hot points in our county. Our commissioners and many legislators had foreknowledge of these coming threats. However, they chose to remain silent toward the public. Our um, Aspect Consulting, another global NGO, provided the legal construction for the water banking detailed in a fairly comprehensive legal brief sent to the commissioners around September the 30th, 2014. I have it right here in totality. I got it straight from Aspect Consulting. This, that's it right here. All their names are on the front page. They knew about this a long time ago. Um, we, have a, we have a lady in the room today that actually um, confronted our commissioners on that and asked for a meeting on water banking. They refused. Why did they refuse? Because we're already buying water rights from people. So, in other words, they didn't want people to be able to make an informed decision. And that's not right. They have an obligation to inform the public. They have an obligation to. And they failed their obligation. Well, they haven't heard the end of that, believe me. They're, they're in trouble, and they know it. That's why they're being so quiet up there right now. They're in big trouble, and they know it. Um, we've monitored a couple of characters meeting with our commissioners who don't live in the county and come on a pretty regular basis up there concerning water rights. And I'm not going to give out their names tonight. We're still investigating them. But uh, one of them is a big uh, attorney from from Seattle who is actually helping to buy the water rights. He works through a real estate agency. And a lot of these water rights, by the way, are not being bought just by your local government. They're being bought by, I've got the document right here, come right to our county, to a landowner, PD Investments out of Oregon. These are private corporations that are buying up your water rights. This is exactly what happened in California. California said they were going to buy water rights from through the state, through the people, too. The next thing they know, Resnick and crew is, is on the scene buying up water rights. And so it always starts out one way and ends up with something else because it's all pre-planned. It's, it's a complete plan from day one. They know exactly what they're doing. Um, so don't fall for the rhetoric. Don't fall for it. Um, So there was foreknowledge of it, and that's a real problem in our, in our county right now. It's, it's causing quite a stir, and I'm almost glad people are finally getting upset. In fact, the cow, I, was, I spoke to the Cattlemen's Association last Thursday night up there, and they're, they're ready to go to war over this. They are ready to go to war over this. And I don't mean, when, what I'm going to say next, I don't mean to be an alarmist at all, but one of the lead cattlemen in the group 
got everyone's attention and the room got really quiet and he said look we've got the wolf issue we've got water issues we've got land issues with the forestry department he goes we have a 10 year trend of losing every battle and I don't mean to, to criticize anyone sitting at the table today, but the legislature, you're new, you get off the hook. <laughs> the legislature hasn't done a thing for us in 10 years. They haven't done a thing for us in 10 years. They've tried. I'm not saying they haven't tried, but they haven't. They haven't been able to do anything because if you look at a 47-year trend on the studies we've done, and these come from professional organizations that study these things, there's a 47-year trend in decline in individual liberty and property rights in America right now. So it doesn't matter, oh, we passed this bill last year and, you know, we helped a little bit there. Okay, fine. But the trend is still going down. You got to look at things in trends. That's what professionals do. They look at things in trends. They don't look at things, well, what we did better last week or we did better last year. Well, you know, we live a lot longer than a week or two, so it matters what happens 10 years from now, 20 years from now, especially if you've got children. It matters. These trends matter. You look at everything in trends. So we're on a, we're on a big 10-year trend on, in these particular battles of losing, losing, losing. And, and they're ready to fight. And basically the rancher went on to say, look, and this is a serious statement. He was serious as a heart attack. He goes, it's going to come to guns, man. It's going to come to guns. For us rural people, it's going to come to guns. You know, and that's a serious statement, but that's something that our elected people need to hear. They need to hear that. It almost came to guns about five years ago in Stevens County over another issue, and I was involved in that, and we, we stopped it, and it was literally coming to guns. And I'm not going to go into that now. We don't have time. You can ask me about it later, but our sheriff in the court in Spokane County was about to do something pretty awful to a family, and 50 guys with guns said, no, you're not and it didn't happen, but, but we forced them to do another legal action that actually brought it to a halt. That's called real leverage. That's real leverage. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Um, but the connection and the catalyst, how do we get from Hearst to water banking? Well, uh, we had an explanation of inflow, inflow stream rules, which is the issue at hand in Hearst, trying to connect surface water to subsurface water. Well, the fact is the Department of Ecology, according to several commissioners that we've talked to, have never even done the actual studies that connect the two. So how can they have a policy and some kind of ruling from the court that says we have to, that this is the way it is when they don't know that's the way it is? They don't know that. They don't know that. You could probably talk to some generational farmers that probably know a lot more about the water flows than these, than these people with credentials do. They, they know a lot more about it. Um, I know for a fact that all that wells necessarily close to a river bank don't connect with that water source. In fact, we got people in Stevens County that have drilled wells 1,500 feet from the water bank from the river and got no water at all. Yeah. Why do you think the river stays where it does? <laughs> think a little bit. There's rocks under there, big rocks, and they form that, that trail of water. And some of that water doesn't get back into the ground necessarily. That water's coming from somewhere else. I don't, that's, I'll leave that up to the scientists and the people who know more about that. But that's common sense. Um, but essentially, water banking is uh, a means of moving water to where it's needed. However, to do that, you must, you got to purchase the water rights of, of, of some property owner in order to do that. Well, we brought it up earlier, and I was, uh, Cecily kind of pointed this out, great common sense, Cecily, and when she said, well, how do you do that without a meter, basically? Well, you can't. No matter what they tell you, you can't do it without a meter. You may, they may not put a meter on it now because of overestimation. Trust me, there will be a meter later. And that's exactly what they were going to do in California, too. They were going to meter all, those, all, the, all the ones that were purchased. They were going to meter them. But in um, Kern County, it wasn't working out too well. They couldn't get through the litigation because the people threw a holy fit and too much of the criminal activity was becoming public. So what they did is the state turned over the water district, the whole water district, to one of these corporations and they went and basically hooked up to the main aquifer and drained it dry. And all the people that were in a certain distance in there lost all their wells. Do you think they got to sue for reparations? No. They didn't have the money to sue. 
how do you sue a multi-billion dollar industry? How do you do that as a little farmer? You can't. So these ideas about, oh, you can, you can sue for reparations or, or um, for damages, if you got a lot of money, you can. But if you don't, you won't be doing that. And you'll just lose. Aspect Consulting and, a local go and local governments had already laid the platform for water banking. Hearst was the hammer needed to create the leverage to make it roll. Um, it's, it's not called law, it's called leverage. This, it, was all, it was all about leverage. Um, I told you about Obispo County and what they were doing as far as how they were purchasing it for such low amounts and selling it for high amounts, but they stopped it at least in that county. Um, currently, Spokane County Environmental Services is already soliciting landowners in Stevens and Pendor counties as well as Spokane County. So, and, and, you know, it, let me say this. Everyone that owns property has a right to sell your water right. I'm not saying that. You do. I mean, that's your right. You can sell your water right if you want to do it. It's a terrible thing to do because it's sort of like the uh, Hitler syndrome. When Hitler came around collecting people, the neighbors didn't want to help, so, and then eventually, I'll make a long story short, he collected enough people to where you were the only one left who was going to help you. Well, it'll work the same way with this. When enough people sell their water rights, everyone else will have to because of the close nature and proximity between the wells and things. You won't have a choice. Can we you, you'll get have to Q&A? I'm on the summary right now. Cool. Thank you. All right, so from GMA to Hearst, water banking is simply an ongoing trend to eliminate any private control of land and water. Coercion, deception, outright lies, denials, and leverage are the tradecraft skills of this syndicated criminal conspiracy. The people of San Luis Obispo County, California defeated the water sharks because they took the reins of the condition into their own hands. And I want to be very kind when I say this, but if you're relying on a legislative solution for this, I, w I wouldn't rely on it. I hope they do, and I would certainly support one, and I would even help them uh, forward one if possible. But I would not rely on that, and the people of, of San Obispo County did not do so because they knew it would take a long, long, long time, and how much damage would be done in that period of time. That's something people don't think about when you talk about a legislative solution. Yes, we need one, but we also need an immediate um, wall in, in, in the meantime. Like the folks in California, your local government and state officials, as they have already done over and over, are going to tell you, you can't do that. Every time we go to our commissioners, and the cattlemen said the same thing, well, and we talk about plans, we talk about ideas, they say, well, you can't do this, or you can't do that, and they can't do this, and they can't do that. That's all we ever hear. There's never a solution. So we actually have a solution in our organization, and we've been working with people to try to teach them how to forward those solutions. It's a local, it's a local fix first. Yes, we need the legislative fix, but it's a local fix first. So I hope all of you will take a brochure, and I'm sorry, I, there's just too much information in order to be any more detailed about what we learned in California and what we've learned in Washington so far. But anyway, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points clear that he spoke with about the aspect consulting and our water banking. And just the process that we went through is in, well, in 2007, we saw what happened in Kittitas County. And then, you know, after a couple days after the Hearst decision was out of the Eastern Washington Growth Management hearing boards, I read that decision and I thought, oh, crap. And so what we did was uh, we knew Department of Ecology was offering grants, so we went and applied for a grant to do a water bank feasibility study to see if it was even possible. Um, that was through a grant that went through the Board of Commissioners at least twice. Um, then we had another grant to do that. Aspect Consulting is a private engineering company that deals with water, um, water resource issues, water uh, infrastructure. Um, they were hired through a competitive bidding process. They're, they're not an NGO. Um, and water banking has been discussed in front of the county commissioners very frequently. And I'm actually, I was very surprised every time we would have a spokesman review reporter in the room, in the hearing room when we were talking about it, telling them things like people might, might not be able to build, saying things like that. And it was never reported in the news. Um, so 
it was it was very upfront and public and uh, out there. Okay. Hey, thank you. On your tables, you'll see this little flyer, and I just thought it was interesting as I was scrolling down. 14, life and liberty are secure only so long as right of property is secure. Strong local self-government is the keystone to, preser to preserving human freedom. So this is a great book. I think you all probably should read it, The 5,000 Year Leap. Uh, you need to learn more about what this country is about, your role in it, and what Jacqueline said, if we'd get out and vote, we could beat those jerks on the west side. Nice. So anyway, we <laughs> <laughs> and can I add a couple Absolutely. things too, um, along that line. I told you earlier, we have a one vote majority. We yeah. are in a very, very serious possibility we're going to lose that vote. So if you know anybody that lives in the Kirkland, Woodenville, Duval area, the 45th legislative district, um, <clears throat> just on the other side of the mountains, I drove through it today on the way home. We have a race there that if we don't win it, Senator Marilyn Chase is going to take over the committee that I now chair. And uh, we do not need her to be in charge of, of agriculture. Senator McCoy would be in charge of water. We don't need that. So we really need help to, to keep that one vote majority. And then next year, we're hoping to, to get uh, Jacqueline in the majority in the House. Um, we've only got two votes there. I do want to respond uh, to a couple comments. We have had one party control, one party control in the Olympia for a, well over 30 years. And the Speaker of the House has been there, what, 30, most of those years. He has so much power over his members, so much power. He's the reason we didn't get that bill passed. The other thing is, it's not the county's fault, it's not our fault uh, that we're facing these decisions. We've got a court that is legislating from the bench. They did it with McCleary. They're doing it now with Hearst. And, you know, the one person that wrote the dissenting opinion from the court, Justice Deborah Stevens, is from Spokane. She gets that. You know, I might not agree with her on a whole lot of other issues, but she gets what uh, we now are facing because of that decision. But the, the courts... Uh, they are legislating more, they're taking control, they're still taking control of McCleary. And it's, it's everybody that's allowing that, the voters are allowing that. We ran really good candidates the last time against the, the three that were running. That's right. Very good candidates. I know one very well, he's from Kittitas County. We didn't get the information out to the voters that we need to, to uh, replace some of those justices. So it's not us allowing it, it's the voters allowing it. And we worked hard to, to uh, replace those from the, from the Supreme Court. So. Okay, let's go to questions. Okay, we have mic runners, so you can't talk till you have a microphone. <laughs> Uh, Senator Warnick, I just want to thank you for all your information this evening, and I appreciate the fight that you've been doing for so long. Um, we all greatly appreciate your efforts. Um, I do have one question. I do have one question um, for both you and Jacqueline, as well as all the rest of the legislators and senators in the state, and that is, um, if you would look at the state constitution, it describes the job of all the legislators and senators as having the authority and the only authority in the whole state to recall judges who are acting in a corrupt fashion. And nobody else can do that. And so um, I, I think that this is easily worth recalling every single judge that was associated with that decision. And then once that is done, then everything from Hearst should be repealed. And that is starting with the very basics of law and so I just want to throw that out there 
because as um, as Russell was saying, when we're coming up to a crisis about this, with um, you know how rural families are going to be devastated, I think that the legislators really need to put on the threat. I mean, you know, really, it, it's it's something that should be done because it is part of the job description. So I just encourage you in that direction. Thank you. I totally agree with that. It's we're going to have to convince a whole lot of other people. There's 147 of us. And we're not all on that same page. So I agree. I think we do have that power. We have the power to call us back for the one day special session we need to pass this bill and the capital budget. Um, but to get the two thirds, neither one of us have two thirds majority. Neither one of us. So it, it's going to take some work on, on our voters part. To, to make that happen. Well, he's uh, getting the mic over there. I have a written question here from someone. Uh, not sure who it's addressed to. How many square feet of outdoor growing area is in each of the water bank packages? How many gallons per day for indoor use? <coughs> I guess it's Mike. Sounds like Mike. Yeah. We, we haven't established it yet we're looking at um, different you know it, I mean what it comes down to is you have a certain amount of water how are you going to divide it up what we have discussed is 2,000 square feet of outdoor irrigation or 6,000 square feet and that was based on a survey we did in 2010 looking at residential water users in self-supplied areas what the most frequent um, quantity of outdoor irrigation they used and the highest reported was 2,000 or 0 to 2,000 square feet and 2,000 to 5,000 square feet and so that's what we're evaluating. The indoor use is actually based on you know in addition to water resources I also our department works in the water reclamation facility and so we operate the Spokane County uh, Regional Water Reclamation Facility and the sewer system so we know a lot about how much water gets used indoor. <coughs> And it is on average about 180 gallons per day per household. And so we have, what we have done is say, we told the Department of Ecology every time we sell a mitigation certificate, we're going to debit 275 gallons. Um, so we know that sometimes you're going to have two people in a household and they're going to use 100 gallons a day. We know that in some households there's going to be six people and they're going to use 400 gallons a day. And so on balance, when you just look across the whole bank, it'll be, if we assume that everybody uses 275 gallons, then there will be no problem meeting that amount. Um, and then, you know, the, the actual metering aspect of it, again, is we are running the bank on a consumptive use equivalent. So we only look at the consumptive use. So just like when you're measuring um, to establish water use for a water right, they look at aerial photos and look at how much you've grown, not how much water you've pumped. They look at what you've actually grown because that is what really matters. And so that's, those are the package amounts that we're considering. We haven't landed on them. It's still a, a discussion in, um, with the board and it's policy that they'll set. And as Mike just all reminded you, there's the eye in the sky that looks at everything. Gary? You aren't selling material for water distribution in agricultural communities. I'm very familiar with this. I know the Dust Bowl now referred to as a, used to be the San Joaquin Valley. And they have signs up there blaming it on a judge. Different issue, but a judge. And a lot of very intelligent people up there jumping through a lot of hoops that you shouldn't have to. There's one aspect I told Al French about a month ago that they missed. And that was you didn't use uh, available publicity. Sean Hannity, back when we had the issue in California, spent a month every day on his show interviewing people in the San Joaquin, the now bankrupt San Joaquin Valley. We have got to use public relations. And Jacqueline, I was listening to you and I felt like you were George Patton. <laughs> you had your pearl handled revolvers and if you ran for governor, I'd give you a check tonight. Do you have somebody Russell, out there? you have hit it on the head. 
This battle, we're fighting it down here. They're fighting it up here. We've got to start getting our resources together and treating this like a military operation. We're losing the war. Um, you know, just real quick, why don't we just partition the state? It's a, there. We've had a bill just about every session to do that. Um, we had a, a bill that would go right down the Cascade Mountains, top of the Cascade Mountains, although there's a few people on the west side that would like to be included it, in it. Um, we've had uh, a name proposed, Liberty, um, State of Columbia. Um, you know, and, and we've had proposals to include Eastern Oregon and Northern Idaho, so uh, maybe even uh, Western Montana, but it comes up all the time. It, uh, I think we have to keep talking about it. We have to keep pushing it. But maybe this will do it. Yeah, it, it probably will. Although, like I said, there's people on the west side. I've been working with uh, Representative Larry Springer. He shared with me uh, a couple days ago, he's got a constituent that can't drill a well. And that's in the 45th legislative district, a very urban district. And that constituent called, and I said, oh, darn, you need to be listening to that person. But <laughs> so, so there are, are some strong rural uh, areas over there. The uh, Democrats that represent those areas should be Republican. They just can't get elected in those districts, that's all. Judy, having come from a company that uh, entered this state uh, 24, 25 years ago where we brought people in and we hired new people that um, are in some cases making six figures. Um, I have helped out countless times from Everett down to Olympia and when I'm asked where I'm from, they ask, why am I in that stupid part of the state? <laughs> When you look at our politics over the last 16 years, 20 years, you see two or three counties out of the 39 counties that we have that vote uh, progressive or whatever term you decide to use this week, okay? When you talk about liberty, okay, I hear frustration from you five members, okay? If we divide our state, we won't have this kind of conversation. We'll be deciding what we need to do to make it better for our citizens. So maybe the push for this water, maybe the real push needs to be, we need to be a separate state. I am one who is on the verge of retiring and looking at other states to say, I don't want to be a part of a state where I have no vote, where my vote does not. The, the small city of, of uh, Spokane Valley have, has really done a grassroots with their city council. They are representing the people and the people are seeing it. So this is no slam against you, I understand, mm -hmm. and I see the worry in your face and the concern because I know you're probably 31 or 32. Yeah, yes. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you guessed that right. Yeah. So we had, we had a senator this year that was temporary because we lost a senator through death, Senator Andy Hill from the 45th. Dino Rossi came back and was a senator um, for, a, he still is until we elect a new one. But he lost by, what, 120 votes? At the beginning of, of this meeting, we talked about the need for our people to vote. Um, we've got to get our folks out to vote because we can win. We can make a difference. And um, I, I hear you with the uh, King County, Snohomish County, and Pierce County. They're the ones. But if we all band together, I mean, look what happened in, in the other Washington. If we band together in these rural areas, we can do it. We just got to get people out to vote. And I, I wish you'd change your... Um, uh, your uh, PowerPoint up there 
to not the not green voters. I know it means <laughs> something different in well, Olympia, w- right? But green and, to me and, means go, and they're go. I get that. But when you said green voters, I looked and right. I thought, what are we talking about? But yep, not but the greenies. Yeah, yeah. So not greenies, but but I I really I can't repeat enough that we need to get folks out. We need to to continue pushing people to vote for those that are going to be on our side. Well, and I'll say something on that fact. I just, I I love our fourth district state legislators. And I mean, they put out a newsletter combined. So, I mean, we got the senator and the two representatives and they, they work together. And, you know, you can't find a vote that they haven't made that you can, can disagree with. And the way I look at it, as long as these folks aren't challenged, they can go out through the state and help the districts that are having, you know, close races and that kind of thing. Because you know they'll all be reelected whether they're challenged or not. So it's the idea of start putting your money where it's going to make a difference. And we have got to start concentrating on the districts that are borderline because you can have a majority. You can get, you know, we can do this. We can really do it. So we've got some great people. We need to really focus on what can we do for Washington State, and if we can't, then split it up. Senator Warnick, if we are able to split Washington, I recommend that first off, the eastern half of the state keep the name of Washington because we represent the valleys of Washington, and Mm -hmm. western part of the state can be the People's Republic of Cascadia. Okay. But on to my question, I'm a builder here in the area, and really it's, my question is, Yes, I'd like to see a resolution of Hearst, but I'm more interested in that root cause, and you mentioned McCleary and Hearst. Those are very clear, as well as not only on the state level, but the federal level, you see overreach by the judiciary. I don't know, is there any discussion of efforts in order to limit, stem that continuous flow that we're seeing from our judiciary? There is some discussions. My seatmate uh, in the 13th legislative district um, is uh, Representative Matt Manweller. He's a professor professor at Central Washington University. I would imagine he's going to show up at this uh, event at the end of the month. Um, he has talked about uh, and introduced bills that would um, create judiciary that represent regions uh, of the state so that we'd have more uh, representatives from Eastern Washington, right? Now the majority of them are from Central Puget Sound, uh, Justice Stevens being an exception. So to create a, a regionalization of our judiciary, I think is one step. Um, they, have, they have done more in the last 10 years since I've been there uh, to take over and legislate from their from their throne, they're an exec. They're the judicial branch. They think that they are the um, legislative branch, and so they're they're overstepping. And and Matt Manuelers told me that over and over. They're overstepping their constitutional bounds um, by some of their rulings and uh, many of their rulings, in fact. So um, we we have done that, but again. We need more people on our side. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I, I was reading an article um, that the Democrats put out. They were really happy that uh, they made such an impact on Senator Short's race and Jacqueline uh, Maycumber's race. Yeah, we got 30%. And they're happy. They're, they're trying to drum up support. Um, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do that in, in these districts. I mean, she's got to work hard to make sure she touches as many people as she can. But I told her this first night I heard her, first time I have ever heard her speak. Um, I've known her as an L.A. And uh, this is the first time I've heard her speak. And she is fantastic. She's a bulldog. <laughs> Absolutely. I have another question for Mike here. Mike, did you look up the water deeds that were assigned in 1906, 7, and 8, et cetera, for the property in the Little Spokane River Basin, Dragoon uh, Creek, Arcadia Orchards? So if, if it was in 1906, 07, or 08, they would actually be pre-water code, and they would be claims. Um, and what we did was we just looked for um, 
water rights that appeared to be still in good standing. And, um, you know, I, I was just going to relate one story about one of the water rights we did find. So we were out looking for water rights and um, trying to find some. And, you know, a lot of them have been relinquished. A lot of people have just gone from irrigation to dry land farming. Um, so we were looking at these, these um, aerial photos and I came across one and I looked at the water right and then I saw, oh, it doesn't look like they've been irrigating. We kept going back and it was in 2016. I got back to 2011 and saw that they had been irrigating. So then I immediately called. It was an elderly woman, about 70 years old. She had leased out her place and the guy was not irrigating and she was not, didn't like that. And you know, it was a big, mis you know, not to her how she had planned it, but if she did not irrigate that season, she was gonna lose it. So I called her right then and I said, you know, you don't have to sell us your water right, but we want to help you put it in trust so you can keep it. And so that, you know, that's the kind of efforts we're going to is to, you know, and you know, it turns out we, we helped her quite a bit to get it in trust and save it. And then she came to us and said, you know what, I'm, I think I might want to lease this to a farmer next year. And we said, okay, just, you know, so, you know, I think and the other aspect is, you know, a lot of water, these water rights could be sold down the river. If this person that owned that 100 acre farm, he was going to, he's going to stop, he's going to subdivide it regardless. He could have sold it down to a winery in Walla Walla. Um, so what we're doing is keeping these water rights within Spokane County. And once you sell it down the river, it's gone. And so those are some <laughs> other... Um, but we looked at every water right out there that we thought was valid. Right. Did you have something to say, Jacqueline? Well, I, actually, yeah, I was going to just touch base. Thank you, Mike, for that. Um, we're, I was going to touch base on when we talk about the 300 gallons per day per family. Um, it's really interesting that we're not so solidified on those numbers because municipalities don't look at those numbers, right? So they build as they need, and the cities draw from the exact same aquifers that we're discussing that they're trying to bank right now and talk about surface water and in-stream rules, and yet they don't follow the same gallons in the municipalities, and that includes Seattle. And then when we talk about, you know, when, when you flush your toilet in Seattle, it's not going, you know, down... It goes to Olympia. <laughs> <laughs> It goes to your clams without, uh, you know, 400 million gallons of raw sewage. So um, that's what's different. You know, it's not going back into the aquifer. It's just gone. And that's something that needs to be addressed. I'm recharging my aquifer when I flush my toilet and, and do these things over time. And I garden. And, and, and I'm constantly recharging this. And that is why it's called exempt. And I'll say it over again. That is why it's exempt. But when you're in the city of Seattle and you flush that toilet and you let the water drain and you take a shower, you are recharging nothing. You are literally pouring it out into the ocean. And so when we talk about, you know, he's going to bank that and, you know, it's really important. And I understand, but let's, let's talk about water code then. Let's open up the water code. Are there other questions out there? Okay, we're only going to take a few more. So grab the guy with the microphone. And don't let him get away from you. <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody, go ahead. What's wrong? Two buttons. Now I don't want it too close. I know everybody's a victim of something, so I'm not going to use that term. I'm just going to use the term that we're screwed. Because I'm into it at 175000 and I may not be able to build on my property. So the property is probably worth crap. We can't sell it. This, this county, this state, especially the ones so close to Idaho, we're about ready to ditch everything and move to Idaho. I'll pay the Idaho state taxes. My payroll lady already told me how much it was going to cost. And it's like, why? Oh, everybody tells me it's going to be so much more. The people there in the legislation, I, I know it's Olympia. I know for the most part here, we're all on the same page. And what Mr. Russell, and I can't read your last name from here, I apologize. You've made the most sense tonight to me because I've been trying to research this since my husband and I found out that that piece of property bought that 
was our dream property to build our house on that we've saved up for is worth crap because we've tried to sell it. And the beautiful thing about this Spokane County is they almost tripled our taxes on that property prior to the Hearst decision. Granted, I fought for three years to get that property tax back down to a reasonable level. I'm not living on it. It's not improved. We paid $12,000 for a well. We now have $12,000 of a hole drilled because we can't use it. I do, uh, I believe there was somebody from uh, the assessor's we, office that was going to be here tonight. Are you here? So, so one of the other things is, it, it, all politics is local. We have to do what we can. But after a while, when you see your dreams literally go down the well of politicians, of people who's it's not politicians, it's corporations in my opinion at this point. It's the conglomerates. Follow the money. Um, th they're so big now that we cannot fight them. But as a group, we can. As a people, we can. We see who's the president. And I know a lot of people are upset about that. And I've lost friends over who our president is now. And here's my thing, after 30 years of being friends with them, you know what I tell them? How do you think I felt the last two terms of our last president? Amen. But I don't hate you for voting for that person. Why are you hating me? They're turning us against each other. Let's not let it happen. So let's, I, I Jacqueline, this is the first time I've heard you speak. You have my support, you have my time. You have anything you need from me. I'll give you my name and number. I need more like you. Amen. And I want to thank you. And if the assessor's here, I would greatly appreciate it. Right, because well, some, something I wanted to say, because he shared with me that they were going through and looking at land like yours and like two parcels I have, and trying to determine how those properties should be readjusted. And the number that he gave me was that they would reduce the property value by 30%. Now, could anyone in this room tell me what is a piece of property worth with no water? Zero. Yeah, forget it, your 30%. It took me three years to get our property taxes down to above where we were when we bought the property, but not triple of what we were paying originally in three years. We, it tripled. It took me three years to fight it. Because I fought it, because I am one yeah. of those people, I will fight it. I asked them to retro me the money back. Because their excuse is, we don't have anybody by you that, that has sold property or sold their house. So this is our determination, and their determination is law. Well, somebody did sell the house next door to us and their property. I used that, here we go, here's, here's your paper. Now you have a thing. Well, great, now we'll do this. Well, it's taking you three years to do that. I want to be retro my money back to the tune of about $4,000. No. Now I lost $12,000 well. Well, all I can say is for any of you that do have property that falls in that kind of a category, I'd like you to, you know, our contact information is on our flyer. I want to know all of you because what I heard Al French say at the CAPER meeting was, was that the Spokane County cannot basically institute a lawsuit because they aren't, quote, damaged. So I contend that those of us who are going to insist that we pay far lower property taxes are going to damage well, the county of Spokane well, greatly, and they will be damaged, and they can well, carry the ball because to us buy. as individuals cannot afford to fight this. The county can. So any, well, that's what it, he's telling I us. Do no, want I want the county to face the bill, not Real us. quick, M Mr. Mike. I just want to say to you, I spoke to you earlier this year. You were very helpful. I, I don't, I think you're doing a, a thankless job, to be truthful. Um, but I think you are trying. I think sometimes maybe people in our local government are getting snowed because they don't know of the conspiracies and blah, 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 or ever how Mr. Russell said the terminology he used. But I do thank you for your help. You did help me earlier this year. 
unfortunately, it didn't really help us, but you at least gave me a guide of which way to go because I was just totally lost on what way to go. And I do appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you. Let's go on to another question. I know Aline's in the back. We have one here. Turn the mics on. Leave them on. Yellow. My question is about the marijuana plant crop or facilities that are going in. I'm in the Deer Park area, <laughs> and within my area, I have six new pot plants going in, and how that is going to affect my water. And how do they get water rights when everybody else is not allowed? They're putting in new wells. Yep. Um, so um, about a, two months ago or so, um, the the county we we enter we uh, adopted a a uh, temporary ordinance. So any future um, marijuana grows from here on out, um, we have uh, increased buffers uh, from the the property lines, wh which which they have to be. Um, we have also um, uh, so so we we've increased the, those minimums from property lines. Um, they uh, and for any of them, they now have to go through a conditional use permit. So they will go through our hearing examiner. Uh, they have to meet those minimum qualifications based on the topography of the land, uh, per, uh, prevailing winds, um, if there's a mountain next to them, you know, where, I mean, just surrounding areas. Um, the hearing examiner will be able to put di additional regulations onto uh, any future pot grows from here on out. But also, the other big benefit of that, because the things that we continued to hear was the neighboring properties, they wouldn't know they have a marijuana grow in until they start building. With a conditional use permit, everybody within a 400 foot radius of that property will now be notified, and then you will be given the opportunity to go in and speak and plead your case to the hearing examiner as well. Um, we were right, never notified, and that, a lot of my neighbors have said that they were, and this is just within the last week that they've put this in. So this is nothing. If if they had started their process prior to that, I mean, if, if they got those vesting rights, wh which we have in in the state of Washington, if they had their permit uh, prior pr prior to our adopting just, of any of these, they just bought the land within the last three months, and they've already cleared it, and they're putting the wells in now. Well, you can talk with, you know, yeah, give no, him it, the information yeah, no, after this. T talk Next. with me after if you've got the. Let's go the to address. another question. I could add a little bit just to that. Um, you know, with respect to the, the water use and why a person can't get a building permit but they can put in a marijuana grow operation, um, the reason that is is because the, the county is, the nexus with water code is the issuance of a building permit. And for a building that nece nece necessitates, <laughs> necessitates um, potable water, we issue for an outdoor grow operation a building permit for a fence. And that's it. Um, now the Washington State Department of Ecology retains all authority to regulate water use. We only regulate the issuance of a building permit. If the w and we've talked with the Washington Department of Ecology about them regulating these marijuana grow operations, and you know we haven't heard back from them. Um, they they have a real reluctance to regulate water use at this point of any type. Well, they're already very regulated. So next. Yeah, Josh, this is particularly for Get you. Get a mic to Aline back there um, before she jumps out of her seat. You know, you're basically, it sounds like you're in favor of this water banking, right? And you're assuring us that uh, the county isn't going to profit from it and that there won't be any metering. But how can you ensure that that's not going to happen at some point in the future? As soon as you're out or the, you know, balance of power shifts, Right. How can you guarantee that all this stuff you're promising us isn't going to happen isn't, doesn't happen? And if you can't guarantee us that, how can you still support it? The reason I'm supporting it is because right now we have property owners that have, so like the, the, the woman back here who just spoke. We have people in her situation who own land, who have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands are invest, invested in land that they cannot use. This is the one way that allows them to use their property. Is it a perfect fix? No. 
I, I've never said it is a perfect fix. Um, but this, this right now, outside of a legislative fix, is the only way you will be able to build a home, put a well on your land that you can use for domestic use. Outside, you know, outside, I mean, it's the only way to build a house outside of going the route of a cistern. If you want to bring a giant barrel next to your house and have water trucked in and filled it up. But there's not many people that want to go that route. This is our only option that we have to allow folks to build and to, to build a home in rural communities. And I, I will say it right here, it's not perfect. But it's our only option that we have right now. Like, sir, it, that's one option, but right now, again, that's gotta come from the legislature as well. That's not something that we can do here in Spokane County. This is our best effort to allow you folks to use your property. It, it is. I, I've, there are individuals, there's one individual who came to me and said that he is, he, something like 30 years ago, about 700 acres, and that was his retirement. He was going to plat it into 70 10-acre plots and sell it off. He is now stuck with 700 acres of, of, of land that has no ac legal access to water. This water bank would allow him to plot that land, people would buy the certificates, build their land, or build their homes, drill their well. It's the only option out there. And I, Julian, I'll tell you right now, it's not the perfect solution, but right now it's the only one that, that's out there. And, and as long as I am a commissioner, you have my word, I will never support metering, and I will never, ever support forcing any landowner to sell a water right that they do not want to sell. I can make you that promise now. I cannot promise you that, it, that if there's a drastic shift on, this, on the county commission that, uh, that that'll never be the case, but it's a promise that I can make from right here in front of all of you. Personally, I will never vote to support metering or forcing anybody to sell a water right that they do not want to sell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 stand up. <laughs> stand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so and and I would hope by 30 years from now the legislature can get that fixed through. You know, I hope water banking isn't the solution that we're using 30 years from okay, now. Okay, it But in is the short time, it's the option we've got. Just a second. 30 years, we'll have 395. Hey. Okay, right now we have one question from the lady in the back of the room who still hasn't found a microphone. I just want to add one thing. And I know thing. you need to say something. Yeah, yeah. okay, well, in, in a moment. I want to add one thing to that, and that is there are 452 property owners in Skagit Valley that thought they were following the law, and they would love to have a water bank because some of them can't sell their homes, can't refinance their homes. The water bank is the only solution that plays within the confines of current law. And so that, it, and you know, if uh, mortgage agencies, lending institutions are the ones that control this really. And then when they started to, to do that in Skagit Valley, that's what we brought to the commissioners and said, do you want to put your residents in the position where they cannot sell their home, they're in, into it for $400,000, $500,000, and they can't do anything. And, and if a person in Skagit Valley could pay $2,000 or $4,000 and be able to, to move on with their lives, I think they would be uh, pretty interested in that. Aline. Quickly. Obviously, there's some really serious issues going on with this whole Hearst thing, but my biggest, well, not my biggest concern, but one of them that I want to discuss is this lady here that has her problems. Real people, real problems, money loss, people are being really hurt severely by this. Think of people who have a retirement and it's worth nothing that have done uh, the planning and everything and all of a sudden, out of nothing, thin air, the courts decide they can do something which is basically creating law, which they're not allowed to do, but we're all dancing to the tune of it, which really is um, not right. But what I wanted to say was we have real people here, and the real people are getting hurt by this, and yet these laws and policies have a lot more heart 
for the non-native fish that needs three times as much water for the base of the in-stream flow rule. Now, how does that make any sense? Because if you take out that non-native fish, put it back in its native grounds, we don't have that problem. Thanks, Eileen. And now the gentleman from the assessor's office who's going to really be attacked. Yeah. I, uh, I, Joe Hollenbeck, and I'm from the assessor's office. I manage both the residential and commercial group there at the assessor's office. When this law came down, uh, I asked Jay, who was in here with today, it's like, Jay, what the heck are we going to do? This was, uh, I've been in this industry now uh, about 26 years, and I've never seen an issue like this. So it had us concerned deeply, and the first thing we said is, how are we going to mitigate this? How are we going to value these properties? That was the biggest thing. Uh, we work with Mike, and we work with our ISD department. We work with our GIS section to, to find these parcels. That was the hardest thing inside of that, of that area 50, 55 that are impacted by this in-stream float rule. So that was the hardest thing we did. Trust me, we have, I have well over 100 hours already into this. This is not something Aww. that I've taken lightly. I've spent many, many man hours uh, trying to figure it out, trying to get uh, an honest assessment of, of what we're going to do on this. Overall, we've reduced the values. We finished up our values for 17 assessment for 18 taxes. And for Spokane County, we've made about a $76 million reduction on the land values. So that's what we came up with. Uh, how we went about this is really it came down to the state constitution written in 1889. There was Article 7. And it basically says how do you uh, fairly distribute the taxes based upon the property class of the properties that you're you know, comparing against. In other, words, in other words, how do you equitably spread the taxes out based upon the values, based upon the property tax you should be paying. So that's, that was the guiding principle for us on at least how to value them. Secondarily is how do we value them on a property that you don't have many benchmarks of sales. It is the buyers and sellers that are going to determine what the taxes are going to be on your property. So what we did is we started uh, with an analysis starting from about 10-1 of 2016, about when the Hearst came into place until we finished it uh, at the end of, uh, end of August. Through that, it was the buyers and sellers of properties and that determined basically what we did as far as the values. On the basis of that, the, it was the sales that we, we were overassessing them at the time. Um, so we had to make reductions on those properties. So we did, we did make a 30% adjustment to the market on those, but it was the sales that dictated what we did. Uh, so that's kind of in a nutshell. Uh, yes, we, we're going to miss the mark on some. We, we may have ones that are inside the hearse that can get, you know, uh, well water. So we're going to miss those as well. Uh, it is an imperfect world that we live in, and is, but we are doing, trust me, the best job that we possibly can. And I, I'd like to talk to you afterwards if you'd like, and we can discuss your, your plight there. Maybe I have already discussed this with you. I don't know. Uh, yeah, have you? Okay. But anyway, I just wanted to let you know uh, this has been a tough thing. I do think uh, the water bank does give a certain level of certainty back to the market. I do believe that. I think that's a good thing because real estate markets don't do well in an uncertainty. Uh, even our models that we developed, they were not a model that I'd want to take to the county fair. Let me put it that way. There was a lot of uncertainty in our figures. But it was the best job that we could do based upon the data that we had you know, available to us. But I just wanted to let everyone know that that's the kind of process we went through. So. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just going to ask the panelists if anyone has one last thing to say, and then we're going to say goodnight to all of you because we are late. Go ahead. Well, I'm, oh, am I on now? Okay, I do want to say one thing. The reason why you can put a pot farm in without a building permit is it's not about water. It's about the building permit. And the reason that the land sales haven't crashed yet is because there are some people that can buy the land and put in houses. All they need is a hydrologist report. You can still build a well under Hearst. You just have to pay the $80,000 for the hydrologist report. Okay, so once again, it's not about the fish, and it's not about the water, and it's not about municipalities pulling whatever they want. It's about control and the building. 
Okay, that's what it comes back down to. And so, you know, I'm going to get excited because this year we didn't need mainstream media to tell us who was going to win the election, right? That's already happened. And when we talk about what's going to occur, and, and Senator Warnick has multiple times, this is on us, right? This is on all of us right now. That's right. And when we talk, we should be rising up collectively in grace and doing what we're supposed to be doing and knowing who's going to be on the judicial, you know, ballot, knowing who's going to be walking tomorrow outside and helping them. And when we do that together and we stand strong together, we might be surprised what happens in 2018. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. We and the, can make a difference. We can make a difference, absolutely. When we talk about this right now, I'm excited because, you know, it didn't just start with the, you know, the Patriots throwing the tea in the Boston Harbor. It started with talking and saying, I'm mad. I thought she was going to say soft footballs. <laughs> <laughs> so let's be patriots. Let's talk to each other. Let's get that other 40% voting and let's do something about it because we can. We have the opportunity now while we're here, while we're mad, and get it going and rise up together. We did it nationally. Now let's just sew the other side of the cascade. Let's raise in great and light and get brighter and brighter and show the other side what we're capable of. Absolutely. And we can do that. We can. We can do that. Jacqueline, you want to be the first governor of uh, the state of Liberty? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, well, you got to talk to another legislator that's been a part of that. <laughs> but I will stand right behind him. <laughs> Anybody else on the panel want to say anything at the end here? And um, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, well, I want to thank you, too. This has been a very lively discussion. But the lady with the property that's lost, you're not alone, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I've, uh, when we had the hearings on the bill, a man came in, got on his knees, and he said, please, please, please fix this. Um, he had four kids. He had sold his house, was going to build on this property, was in the process of getting the permit when the decision came down. And he now lives in his mother-in-law's single-wide trailer with four kids. Another family had an autistic son needed to be out of town, needed to be in an area where there was nature. They can't move out there because their property has, it counts on a, a, a well. So you're not alone. I think if we all stand up, we all shake our fists, it will happen. But we need more of them in Central Puget Sound to stand up and do that. But uh, count on us. We're doing what we can. And uh, we're going to keep pushing, keep pushing. So I understand that practically all of you, except Russell, will be at another panel like this next Wednesday, is it? Oh, I will be. Uh, you? I, I, and you? Okay. And you? Okay, so not, not I think you. We're, we're, we're swapping out one senator for another. Yeah. Uh, senator Shelley Short will be there, I believe. Okay, great. So that's at the uh, service station up on North Nevada uh, next Wednesday at... 5.30. So, you know, you guys, there's a lot of information to cover. You'll probably think of 14 questions that you want to ask, that kind of thing. You go to that and bring other people to it. We need to get the community informed. We really do. So how about a big thank you, Judy, especially all the di distance you've traveled. Uh, Jacqueline with a uh, few hours sleep for the last, uh, goodness knows. This lady dry, I mean, that, that district is huge and she's been in her car forever. Uh, these guys are, forget this part-time legislation stuff, it's forever. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.